This is Jocko Podcast number 384 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. I was studious by nature and I had read considerably about the war. I knew that the careless way in which we fired our guns and dropped bombs in France was hurting lots of people. The average time in which a British soldier was still able to fight after he landed in France was three months. Killed, wounded, gassed, captured, something put them out of action in an average of 90 days. So I enlisted with my eyes open, expecting to get killed, but hoping to have done more than my part before I got mine. I was young enough that I had a desire to be something great when I died so that my parents would receive a posthumous reward of some sort of medal and know that Bob had died bravely. But I did have ideas about the way I was to die if I must, and none of these ways was with a bayonet or a knife in my ribs. I had an antipathy toward cold steel entering my body and trained hard to learn all I could about bayonet work. In fact, all through the war, I trained just as hard as I would for an important athletic contest. I often thought that might be out in no man's land or meeting some form of an attack where I would come upon hand-to-hand fighting with a German and he might be one of the great old German strong men of whom I had read. I knew that they would have much more strength than my slender frame possessed, and in order to remain among the living, I had to acquire skill to win such a battle. I not only worked hard during the training time, but I talked to every man I met who had experienced hand-to-hand work at the front so that I could learn any tricks there were. These tricks did save my life later in the war. I must explain here that although I expected to die in the war, I knew that one army beat the other by greater courage or greater efficiency in fighting. The side that inflicts the greatest casualties on the other would ultimately win. Therefore, I intended to sell my life as dearly as possible and see how many of the enemy I could take with me or send before. I never got careless. I always had my gas mask. I always carried a shovel and pick with me throughout the war. Some men became tired and threw their entrenching tools away, but not I. I was the champion digger of the American army. Every time we stopped, I dug a hole. We didn't know when we stopped or whether it would be five minutes, five hours, five days, or five weeks. And as long as we were there, I improved my little dugout. And I can tell of many cases in which this digging saved my life. I owe much of the fact that I am here to careful training and superb physical condition. And that right there is a little excerpt from the book, I Remember the Last World War, which was written by Bob Hoffman. It's a book we covered early in the podcast, podcast number 27. So that's like seven years ago. And he wrote another book called How to Be Strong, Healthy, and Happy. This is a guy that fought in the First World War. And he fought in the trenches in the First World War. And in those books, he explains over and over again the importance of physical activity, of being strong and being able to lift weights and being able to do pull-ups and being able to run. And in his books, he actually complains that men were getting weak. (laughs) This was in the 1930s, by the way. He goes on tirades about how men spend too much time watching motion pictures. They eat too much bread, biscuits, pies, pastries, and donuts. That through physical training, you could condition yourself to obtain pleasure from overcoming and defeating problems and obstacles, and that this would give you greater confidence in your own abilities. By the way, like I said, these books are written in the 30s. Bob Hoffman spread the word as widely as he could in his life. He founded the York Barbell Company, which is still around today. He started started a, a whole media arm, which in those days meant he started Muscular Development Magazine. He founded the York Oil Burner Athletic Club. That's what he was going, that's what he was doing. And we'd be in a much better place I think if people actually listened to Bob Hoffman, but they didn't. 
and our health as a country has continued to decline. But in my old job in the Navy, we were always searching for ways to get stronger, get faster, get healthier, get better. And we tried, when I first got in, the, the we tried what our training was, which was calisthenics and traditional physical training, military physical training. We tried some weird combination of triathlons and bodybuilding. We played around with Olympic lifting and power lifting, maybe even a little gymnastics. Some guys really pushed to see what worked and what didn't. What could get us ready for combat? That was, the, that was what we were looking for. What would get us ready for combat? And what that means is there's an infinite number of things that combat can bring. So what can we do to get ready for just about anything? And people were trying to figure that out. One of the people that was trying to figure that out was a guy named Dave Castro. He's a SEAL who deployed many times overseas, deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. He wanted to be strong, wanted to be fast, wanted to have endurance, wanted to have explosiveness. And he, over time, found a path for physical fitness. And he's led, kind of like Bob Hoffman, he's led many people down that path, including many SEALs, many special operations personnel, conventional soldiers, Marines, law enforcement, first responders. And on top of that, just like Bob Hoffman was trying to do, he's done that with everyday civilian human beings that just want to be better. And it's an honor to have him here with us tonight to talk about his experiences and lessons learned. Dave, thanks for coming down, man. Jocko, thanks a lot for having me. It's an honor. Um, I'm excited to dive into all of these topics. That was a great intro, by the way. That's a powerful book. I definitely am going to pick that up and, and dive into it. Yeah, it's an awesome book. And his other book over here, which is called How to Be Strong, Healthy, and Happy, is this one is just combat. It's literally combat. I was looking at it yesterday. It's combat till the last page. The last page, like people are getting killed and then it ends. This book, though, How to Be Healthy, uh, Strong, he- Happy, and Healthy, is is more of a manual. And it's very interesting. You know, Some of the quotes I pulled out of both of those, but it, it's incredible that people have been trying to figure this out and trying to teach people about this for so long. And that's what made me bring bring that's what made me think about those books because this is what you've been trying to do for the last i don't know what it's been it's been 15 years something like that more almost 20 almost yep. 20 years yep. you've been trying to do this um let's start at the beginning let me let me say this yeah but before even the beginning i want to talk about this and and the path and it, his journey and how he was searching for the best way to get basically strong and fit and ready for combat and exactly what you were saying not a lot of guys acknowledge well, honestly, prior to CrossFit, the way we were training, you, you hit it. There was triathlete, triathletes, people biased towards that. There was um, guys who biased towards physical or um, just body weight stuff, pull-ups, push-ups. And then you had the bodybuilding type. And every one of those was sort of done in isolation. And people, gra- especially once you got to the teams, mm-hmm. people gravitated towards what they wanted to do. I was a runner. And that's what I excelled at in buds. And as I went to different teams, that's what I was good at. So I, I kind of followed that. Stayed away from the heavy weights. I'm a, I'm a smaller guy. And so, and you know what's interesting? I don't know if your experience is different, but mine on the East Coast, I hardly saw anyone doing Olympic lifts. Um, back squats and deadlifts saw a number of guys who, especially football players or guys mm. who are athletic who did that. But the Olympic lifts, I don't think I saw many people doing those at all. Yeah, I would, when I mentioned gymnastics, the only reason I got to throw that in there is because my commanding officer at SEAL Team 1, when I was a brand new guy, he was a gymnast. Yep. And so he, this is the first guy I ever saw doing muscle-ups yeah. on the pull-up bar. Remember that little bar, pull-up bar at SEAL Team 1? It was a really nice, heavy pull-up bar. Yep. And I was a new guy, and I'm out there watching him going, oh, damn, like I need to up my game. Yep. And he's another dude, like he was jacked. Yep. And I, and I used to think this dude's getting his uh his khakis tailored. <laughs> you know, his uniform was tailored cuz he had a V body and his R, his sleeves were real tight. He was jacked, but he was doing muscle ups. And I remember thinking, what is that? Yep. And then starting to try and figure out how to do it on a bar. Never thought of rings. Never yep. n- never would have thought of rings until like until the CrossFit stuff started com- getting to the teams and I'm I'm sure we'll get to that, but so then I, so I started deploying and I went to Afghanistan and on my first trip to Afghanistan, um, we started doing combat ops 
And in preparation for them, I was running because that's what I defaulted to. I was a runner. And you'd insert, hike over these mountain ranges or hike over these uh, terrain features. You'd get to target and then you'd go really hard and then you'd come out, insert or exfil out and go back. And I felt like on target and I wasn't I didn't have enough power, enough kick. I didn't feel like I was fit enough. And so naturally I was like, okay, I need to run more. I need to increase. <laughs> um, I need to increase the amount I run. And at Bagram, we had a, there was a loop around the entire base, and we'd run it. You'd run it once. It was four or five miles. So like naturally, I need to do, do it twice. And so I started doing that more, and I still didn't see me- much improvement at all on target. So I was intrigued by that, I, and I was doing a lot of body weight stuff too. So combining them and thinking, how can I get the most out of fitness, or how how can I take this to the next level? Every one of us in the teams has a passion. It sounds like early on your passion, a passion almost even outside of, of the, the work, but related to the work. Sounds like you got into jujitsu. Yep, I did, um, sure enough. Mine was rock climbing. So early on when I was in the teams, I got into climbing and I just went all in. And that's what I really enjoyed doing. On my off time, I'd go climbing. I was a lead climber, um, all types, ice climbing, rock climbing, bouldering, um, big walls in Yosemite. I just really went all in on that aspect of, of the job and on a personal level. Well, Mark Twight, he was this famous climber and he had this book called Extreme Alpinism. And he talked a, a lot about the way he trained and the alpinist, the alpinist's um, per mindset towards going super light and super fast in their routes and in their climbing, that really resonated with me. I saw that and I was like, okay, that's that's similar to our mindset and what we're trying to do. We're always shaving ounces and trying to go as light as possible um, on our missions. And so that aspect resonated with me, the way they approached their climbs and the way they um, tackled them once they were there. And this was specifically Mark Twight. This was a guy, these guys were radical what they were doing. They, they were insane. They were climbing peaks that would take guys four or five days in 48 hours to 24 hours. Straight. Because of their philosophy of super light and super aggressive and fat, light and fast light and fast. They would they would set the records on all these routes. And a lot of it, it was, wasn't just for the fact of doing it quickly, it was for safety too. The faster you get up and down the mountain, the safer you are ultimately. Um, and I read this book he had, it was Extreme Alpinism, and he talks about his training. And it was long, slow, L- LSD, long, slow distance stuff. Uh, go out for three hour bike rides, go out for um, two hour runs. And, and that's how he prepped for all these endeavors. So that's in my mind, I was like, I need to do more of that to prep for this stuff get back from a deployment and we were able to hire him out to do some training him and his staff and we went to yosemite and on a training trip we were doing some climbing with some of the other climbers on the team and a number of his world-class climbers i said hey mark so tell me this is at dinner in the cabin after a full day of climbing tell me about your training tell me about the long slow distance stuff and he said i don't do that anymore and I go, what? I was blown away because like I studied his books and he was an icon to me. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't do that anymore? <laughs> he goes, I do something different. He goes, I do CrossFit. It's this program that's created by this guy in Santa Cruz named Greg Glassman. And I go, well, what is it? And he's like, it's body weight movements, it's pull-ups, it's running, it's cleans, it's deadlifts. And I was super skeptical because I'm the skeptical guy by nature. <laughs> and when you look at Mark Twight, he's... A, I'm a small guy. He's even smaller than I am. He's he was probably 150, five foot nine, five foot eight, and I was like, okay, cool. This all sounds really cool, but coming from him, I don't know if you know this is the right thing for a SEAL who's deploying to Afghanistan. And I heard him. I listened. I started researching. I started looking into CrossFit. I started looking at all the uh, the website, at all the journal articles, and it it was incredibly intimidating, especially because I didn't grow up with um, the Olympic lifts or powerlifting, really, or any of those movements. So the movements, I was like, man, I don't even know if I can do any of those movements. I saw stuff like air squats, and I'm like, I can do that. I I looked at a lot of things I could do and and said, okay, it doesn't seem too bad. But I didn't buy it, and especially because he was the guy who um, exposed me to it. So I sat on it for a while, researched it, actually ended up deploying again. And even on deployment in the room where we had um, internet, I was sitting at one of the computers. I'd sit at the computer every night and check out the workout of the day. Still not what having done this? it. What year is this? This is uh, 3-4. Oh, 3 oh, 4 oh, 3 oh, 4 cool. 
still not having done it myself yet. We had a guy who was really fit on the team, and he came in and he sat down next to me. And he said, what are you looking at? And I said, oh, this is CrossFit. You should check it out. He's like, oh, what is it? And I start telling him it's this, uh, this workout that combines all these different features and elements, and they're really fast, and, and, a, and it gets you really fit. I, I kind of faked him out and gave him the impression <laughs> that I was doing it. So he's like, awesome. I'm going to dive in. He started doing it, and I started from afar just watching how it was affecting him and the results he got from it. And he fell in love with it, and he saw a lot of results from it. And we came back from that deployment, and I still hadn't um, made the plunge and decided to do it. So later, I ended up breaking my ankle in training, so that delayed the uh, the effort. Deployed to Iraq, and on day one of being there, decided, all right, I'm going all in, and I started doing it. And it, I, and the thing about, as you know, uh, Iraq versus Afghanistan in terms of op tempo in uh, Afghanistan, missions took a little longer to develop. At once a week, well, maybe twice a week at the max. At the time, we were doing missions. Iraq, you're going out every night. And so or you have the potential to go out every night. And so we were on one of those every night type of situations. Go out, come back, hit the workout of the day from CrossFit.com, go to bed, wake up at night because we're in a nocturnal rotation, and, and just repeat. And I started seeing great results, and I fell in love with it. Interesting story there. One of the other guys I was with, he saw me doing it, and he's like, hey, I think I want to uh, try it. I go, all right, when the next workout pops up, let's do it. And so the next day, we were just following the workout of the day. The workout that popped up was a workout called Linda, mm-hmm. three bars of death. So it's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 of deadlift, like one and a half times your body weight, bench your body weight, and uh, clean three quarters of your body weight. And it's really one of the harder CrossFit workouts and he did it and as his first CrossFit workout ever on deployment and I think he even tried going RX I had to scale because the, the, those weights at that time were uh, too hard for me to do even though I was developing strength um, so that was that was how I got into into the fire but I, I researched and watched for a long time before actually taking the plunge uh-huh. yeah um, well, damn, you jumped, right? Right, You skipped the whole thing I was going to start with, which is like, where were you born? <laughs> I'll go there. We can go there right now. <laughs> so just to get us up there, where were you born? I was born in um, San Jose, California, 77. And, and were your parents, what did your parents do? My dad, um, he ran a trucking company. Okay. And so he had a truck yard in San Jose. And when I was uh, in about 84... 85, we moved from San Jose to uh, Aromas, where he bought a 65-acre property, and that's the, the home of the CrossFit Games many years later. But he moved us out there to consolidate basically his trucking operation and um, the, the house. So it was all co-located. And um, even now, so that's still in the family, both my parents have passed. My brother and I, we own that property, and, and that's where, again, the games have been held multiple years, and I spend a lot of time there. It, the, the, the place means a lot to me. The, it's the CrossFit Ranch, right? Yeah. Is that what that's, it's known as? Yep, yep. And was your dad in the military? Was your mom in the military? No, neither of them were in the military. None of, no, uh, actually, that's not true. My um, grandfather from my mother's side, he was in the Korean War. Okay. Yeah. So he had military experience. And, you know, as a kid growing up, he had his M14 that he was able to, well, I don't know, M1. <laughs> yeah. And um, put um, underneath the bed and we'd pull it out and look at it. And he had his ribbons on the wall. So there was def- that was definitely influential. But in my inner circle, there were very little uh, military influence or connection. And you mentioned that you, when you were growing up, or you mentioned that you were a runner, was that which the sport that you did when you were in high school and everything? Well, no. So the, the interesting thing, thing about the running is um, I didn't discover that I was a decent runner until I decided I wanted to be a SEAL and started following the BUDS warning order. The oh, BUDS okay. warning order was this online packet that told you how to prepare for BUDS. And it had like um, running and PT a running and PT program that escalated in, in difficulty. And once I started doing that, and that was right after I graduated from high school, I realized I was a pretty decent runner. And I thought, I wish I would have ran in high school. Here's what I did in high school. I was on the football team for all four years. I might have started one game. <laughs> I uh, tried out for the basketball team. I didn't get picked. I, um, and I tried really hard at these things to, to, 
to make it to the team. And like I put a lot of effort into uh, football. And I also tried, dabbled in wrestling. Uh, that, I just didn't dig it. <laughs> Was into martial arts, really into what I, martial arts? I did um, escrima, so f- uh, Filipino oh, stick wow. fighting. I did uh, traditional karate, tr- traditional taekwondo. Um, UFC was like I remember watching the early like one and two and mm. three, and those were coming up in those days. Into boxing as a youngster, just um, training on my own. Mm. The, the martial arts formal training, the boxing on my own. The lack of success that I had in high school sports is a big part of why I decided I wanted to become a Navy SEAL. How did you hear about the SEAL teams? So the summer after I graduated from high school, 96, I went to the movies with my girlfriend at the time. We watched a movie with Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage called The Rock. (laughs) (laughs) Hell yeah. And um, you know the story in that movie, a group of Marines take over Alcatraz and then they call the baddest motherfuckers in to come save the island, to save the nation from the nuclear weapons they have. And these dudes, Michael Bean, like that was like the third or fourth movie he'd been a seal in. <laughs> he comes in, he's the commander, and it's these guys in all black. And then they have all this cool gear. Then they insert in the water with their little mini submarines, and the dude comes up out of the water with the MP5. And I'm like, man, these guys are badasses. And then they come through the sewer and come out of the shower, and the Marines waste them. Didn't matter. I was already heavily influenced <laughs> by the black gear and how cool everyone was. So I left that theater and I started researching everything I could about Navy SEALs. And I started watching all the movies, read all the books. And uh, the thing that kept returning in what I was consuming was the fact that the training was the most difficult training in the military. And at this point, I had been accepted to Cal State University Monterey Bay. So I was going to college and my parents really wanted me to go to college. But that notion of the toughest training in the military, something happened. I went, I wonder if I can do that. And that was fucking it. Once I said, I wonder if I can do that, I was like, I need to chase this and I need to figure it, find out if I have what it takes to go through this training and become a SEAL. And, and again, I had this burden of feeling like I didn't accomplish much, much athletically in high school. And I was like, and, and here's the thing, and we know, I'm saying accomplish much athletic, athletically, Buds is not athletic. You, you do have to be in shape, but Buds is 100% a mental test. I would learn that later. I didn't realize that at that point. But um, so I told my parents I wanted to do it, and they're like, no way, you gotta go to college. And so I said, okay. So I started school. About two months into it, I had this other realization. I thought, if I don't do this now, if I finish school, because they said, hey, finish school and then do it after that. I thought, I might not ever do this. Life will change. Life can change so much. If I don't do this right now, I said to myself, and it's pretty funny when I think back of it, even being 18, 19 at the time, that I was able to... uh, or whatever, that I thought this, I, I thought, I don't want to be 30 years old and looking back and saying, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL at one point. I'm like, I need to do this now. And I dropped out of high school, and or college, sorry, and told my parents I'm enlisting, and I enlisted. And I and that that for me, even that moment, that less that life lesson, that that's been something that's meant a lot to me. And I, I even advise people or help people with that. Just like, hey, sometimes you have to t- chase the dream, because if you don't, if you delay it, there can be so many other things that get in the way of it ever happening. And you don't want to have that regret. But here's the thing: you have to be really measured and realistic about that. Because I think that, especially with social media and a lot of the messaging, there's a lot of the chase your dream and all that shit that's really surface level and shallow. But there's a big process you have to go through in your mind and in understanding what it represents to chase it, if the timing's right, if you should, rather than just recklessly chasing the dream. Yeah, because the reality is of every you know guy that goes, so I, I'm gonna go for it. 80% yeah. of them don't make it. Yeah. It's probably more than that too. Like exactly. 80% of the people that actually make it to Buds don't make it. So you don't have a really good chance of making it. Did you, uh, what kind of prep did you do? Like, so you're doing this Buds warning order? Mm-hmm. It, but the Buds warning order was an online uh, program that uh, NSW put out. So this was 96, 97. Internet was obviously around then in the early stages. and. They had built out, maybe not the early stages, but it had been around for a number of years. They had built out um, a recommended training mm-hmm. protocol 
four buds. And, and you did it, stuck to it? I stuck to it. I, I would, I'm that type of person, like if there's a training for an event or a training protocol that the event's putting out, you probably should take a look <laughs> at it and follow it because they're probably trying to set people up for success. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I followed it at the time. So when you get to buds, or how was boot camp? Was it a shock to your system? Were you like, no, this is what I signed up for, good to go, I'm down with folding underwear and Boot whatever. camp was a massive shock, specifically <laughs> culturally. Uh, I grew up in California and I remember going through the lines and I'm like, hey, uh, what's this thing called grits? And like, oh, I had never even heard of grits. And so like, I had never really left California or that area my entire life. And so <laughs> it was um, a big cultural shock for sure. One other interesting thing about that period too, especially once I went to Bud's, growing up in California, growing up in that area, growing up Hispanic as a Mexican, when I was applying for colleges, the messaging and everything was about, hey, make sure you tell them you're Hispanic. It's going to help you get in. It's going to help you. It's going to help you get admission. It's going to help you advance. And I was like, okay, cool. I didn't know any better. I was a kid. Once I got to the Navy, to the military, once I got, especially once I got to Bud's, I saw that that didn't matter <laughs> at all. It didn't matter what color you were. It didn't matter where you were from. What mattered was uh, performance and the standards that they put out and that you met them and that you uh, worked hard to accomplish those goals. So a little shock to the system and you get done with that. You check into Bud's. What, so what year is it when you get to Bud's? So uh, ni- late 97, so, graduated in 98. Okay. What was strengths and weaknesses going through Bud's? I think my strength was being um, kind of middle of the road. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't, I didn't excel at anything. Um, I was good at running. So that was definitely a strength. Um, like you never fell back on runs. Never fell back on runs. Uh, not good. A weakness was swimming. <laughs> swimming for sure. <laughs> How um, about just general comfort in the water? General comfort in the water. So even now at this stage, I'll say, hey, I'm not a fast swimmer, but like, especially because of the training and all the years, I'm really comfortable in chaotic environments mm-hmm. in the water. So being comfortable in the water that was trained into me through through that training, um, I didn't know I was comfortable in the water prior to Buds. Mm-hmm. But, um, oh, and I did sort of even back up. I swam a lot. And the Buds warning order had a swimming protocol. I swam a lot to get ready for Buds because I wasn't a swimmer. Um, through high school. And as you know, the difference between someone who has a swimming background and someone who does not, who goes to training like that, it's massive. It's mad. Quick story on that. We were swimming, if you don't mind. Um, We're here for We were swimming once I was at a team, many years later, around um, an island in Puerto Rico. We were for, we pushed to Puerto Rico for a little um, outpost. I, I want to say deployment, but it's silly to say that we deployed to Puerto Rico. Um, <laughs> and so there was an island off our base a few hundred uh, yards away, and uh, we'd swim around it. We'd launch from the shore, swim around it, and come back as a as a platoon. And I'd been swimming a lot at the time because I wasn't a good swimmer. And I was like, okay, I want to train, and I want to get better, and I want to represent myself well on these evolutions. We take off, and as you know, in the teams, most of the swims, at least we were doing on the East Coast, we're with Finns. We're going around the island, and I'm in front of everybody. And I'm like, all right, cool, the training's paying off. And one of our officers, I forgot his name, he was on the other, uh, on our sister platoon. He starts slowly passing me, and I'm like, this is fucking awesome. I've, all my work's paying off, because he swam in college, and I'm in front of him. And as he passed me, he had no fins on. Yeah. <laughs> yep, he had no fins on, and I was like, all right, th- that's the difference right yep. there. We all had fins on, he had no fins on, and he, uh, he came out and, and beat everybody on the, on the swim. Anyways, back to strengths and weaknesses. So um, I think it was this, my mindset, the way I approached it, I think really um, was a strength ultimately, obviously, because I made it through and just, it sounds so silly, even when I say it, but it is powerful in how to make it through. There was a point where I woke up and I said, I still have five months of this shit. I still have five months of all this bullshit we're going through (laughs) and like, how am I going to survive this? And I stopped thinking about how much time we had left to go through it. And even in workouts or endurance stuff I do now, I'll still sometimes stop thinking about the, the total duration and just think about what's in front of you. So at that point forward, all I thought about was, um, 
just make it to the next meal and just make it to the next meal. And that, that was, uh, I had to think sitting in the cold, sitting in the surf, all right, the next meal is going to be in three or four hours. This isn't going to be that hard. <laughs> one other interesting thing about when I got there, I was one of the younger guys in the class at 18, 19. I was paired, my roommate was a 32-year-old force recon gunny sergeant. Dang. Yeah, and so talk about opposite ends of this spectrum and talk about a culture shock. And we became really good friends and spent time together. And you had this guy who was a hardcore Marine, ex-Force Recon, ex-Special Force. And I had just watched The Rock a year earlier, so I knew everything about Force Recon. <laughs> and um, so he, his presence was also really um, seeing how he handled everything and how he was just quiet and professional and um, how he conducted himself was a huge influence. And I, I don't think it was by design that one of the younger guys in the class was put with someone like that through to be a roommate. And, um, you know, when I was not, um, let's say, behaving professionally as a young sailor, he was there to straighten me out. Mm -hmm. I had a like an E5 roommate who, same thing, like he was just older, had been around. And then he quit. <laughs> well, that's where I thought you were going with that nope, story. No, this guy, this guy stuck good. through. That's yeah. awesome. He made it through. Uh, did you get rolled back for anything? No, I made it through my first time. And um, just, again, like the middleman, just making it through every evolution, uh, didn't get injured and didn't get performance rolled. If anything, I was very close at multiple times to getting performance rolled for um, – Swimming. Mm -hmm. but How about like pool comp and stuff? Were you good to go? Yeah, I made. I mean, I might have failed once or twice, but never um, like where you get to right. the the limits of how many times you can fail. Yeah, it sounds like you f f were the same as me. Like I didn't. Well, you sound like you were a better runner. Maybe I was a better swimmer, yep. but I didn't win anything. Yep. Never ran. Never came close to winning a run. Never came close to winning a swim. Never came close to winning an obstacle course. But I also never got rolled back for anything. And yep. Yep. I failed pool comp and then I passed it. So being that what they now call, I guess they call it the gray man now, which is like yep. you're just, there's a lot of people in that class. And if you're kind of just blending in and you're getting the job done, yep. it's kind of a nice place to be. You know, because as you have the loud mouths, you have the guys that stand out for being characters, you um, have the guys that get a lot of attention for performing poorly at everything. I just tried avoiding those extremes. Mm -hmm. I just tried staying away from that. Like I had a, I got to do my job. I, I don't want too much attention from the instructors, good or bad. Could you win the runs? Would you win a four mile time run? We had some fast guys. Okay, so you yeah, come in no. like fourth or third yeah, or something exactly. like that. I wouldn't. I couldn't win them. We had some really fast guys. Everything I had to. I had to put out really hard to pass everything. Like <laughs> everything I did, I kind of had to put out hard. There was no crew. I had no crews. I don't think other than life saving. Life saving. I was not worried about. I'm like I'm going to kill the whoever my instructors. <laughs> I'm going to fight them. So I was kind of fired up. Were for you that big one. then? No, nope. I was 174 pounds when I checked into Buds. I was 185 okay. pounds when I graduated. Okay. What about you? Do you remember where you were? In the 50s. Okay. Yeah, I was smaller than even. Yeah. I was just hostile. You know, I was good at like I'm gonna I'm gonna fight this dude. I saw it as a fight, so I think that helped me. <laughs> uh, so you graduate from Buds, and then where you go? I go to the East Coast, and I spend all my time um, pretty much on the East Coast. And what team did you start at? You. you so this is funny, and this is going to be a good conversation. I've kind of drawn a line in the sand with myself as a SEAL professional, or even on the outside now, where like I don't like talking about the numbers. I don't mm -hmm. like talking about any of that stuff. Because when I was working for CrossFit, it was um, when I started working for CrossFit, I was still an active duty SEAL. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple other SEALs around. And I saw how Glassman and the media team kind of wanted to, I don't want to yeah. say take advantage, but highlight, right? And I was like, hey, I don't want my identity to be built around me as a SEAL uh -huh. or my exploits. or So they, they really listened to that and they did a really good job of not highlighting. So I kind of, I told myself at that time, hey, the, the ex a lot of the experiences I had and the teams I went to and the things I did, I'm not gonna talk about. Especially as I started seeing, once social media came around, mm -hmm. how met much guys did and how how many lines gr guys cross now mm -hmm. so the thing i'm trying to be at this point i still meet people in crossfit who come up to me and say hey i've been following you for 10 years and i just found out you're a navy seal and i'm like fucking success you did good yeah i'm like fucking <laughs> success and so at this point i i have a i 
some some of the units I've been at, I still have guys. I still get invited back to the to the reunions or to the events. I have senior leaders say, "Hey, thank you for for handling yourself the way you do." In regards to all of that, and um, and so even the question of what team I'm at, it's it's like anyone can talk about. It. It's not a big deal, but for me, it's just like a personal line mm-hmm. that I'm really trying to stay with conviction of of not diving too far and going into publicly. I don't, you know, I've had people online say Dave Castro was never the seal that Jocko Goggins or whoever was. After they said someone else, and I don't know who was another public seal, and I'm like motherfucker, you're only <laughs> saying that because you know some, and no, like no well, offense at all, but because of you. how of the seal things they show and talk about, yeah. And like, I don't want people to know what kind of seal I was, what level of seal I was, and I, I don't, um, I don't want to be known as that guy, and I want to, um, and. Forgive me for like, I'm not saying you're known as that guy. It's all good, man. But, um, and I also want to show an example to younger SEALs that, hey, you can kind of transition out or get out and do something and not lean on it so much. Because I think you'll agree with me here. There's some guys that are way, um, I don't want to say abusive with it, but over the top. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's like, well, this is what I did for 20 years of my life. There's no like, well, hey, here's 20 years of my life. These are the lessons that I learned. This is where everything came from. That, that's the way it is. Um, you know, the, the, to, to your point of like, well, geez, Dave Castro must not have been as good of a seal as Jocko. That's just embarrassing. Yeah. Because both you and I know that there's seals that did 25 deployments yeah, and exactly. are the most heroic guys ever. I, you know they're just outstanding yep. and they're no one knows who they are no one yeah. knows who they are outside the community and that's the way they want it and that's the way they're gonna be and the, so the, so that's just like a terrible thing to even think about um there's this like pop iconic culture now pop seals there's like these icon seals who are and you're one of them and and i and you know it's funny and it's totally fine and i respect it and um when i'd first have these conversations with people about you or Goggins, and I would say, hey, I don't have a problem with what they're doing. It's just not the way I want to do it. Mm-hmm. And and in regards to um, even your situation, you're exactly right. It's your experiences. And I want to say something. I just, since you decided to ask me on the podcast, I decided to pick this up <laughs> and I decided to start reading it. And I'm 100 pages in and it's fucking great. You did a really good oh, job with thanks, it. Man. And um, But for years, any of these books, any of the other ones out there, I wouldn't touch or read or, or even um, acknowledge. The movies I don't watch. Um, other than The Rock. Other than The Rock. Yeah, that was legit. Oh, and let's talk about Active Valor in a second. I'm gonna write that down. Well, I'll talk about it now. Active Valor, mm-hmm. I think, was a breaking point for a lot of these SEALs out there and a huge mistake of our leadership in sending the wrong message to our community. Mm -hmm. And here's why I say that. Even before Active Valor, especially after Vietnam and Marcinko era, there'd been a lot of SEALs who did books. SEALs even before modern era, more common than it felt like some of the other special forces, Delta, you name it. Then I felt like Active Valor was this moment where we were all taken advantage of, Mm -hmm. meaning the Navy the command, the leadership said, we're going to take SEALs and we're going to put you guys in a movie and we're going to utilize your likeness to profit off of, essentially to recruit with, and um, and you're not going to get anything from it. And so you have all these guys at that time saying, well, the Navy did it with us. Why can't we do it? Why can't we do it when we get out? Why can't we capitalize on what we've done? And so I think Active Valor laid the foundation for opening up the floodgates, for sending the message to a lot of guys, um, hey, it's good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out there with it. Yeah, I, I don't know much about the backstory. Mm-hmm, neither do that, I, and I'd be curious of what the backstory is. I do know that. Here's what I know about it. They were initially gonna make like some kind of a modern version of the Be Someone special video, yeah. which was a video that I watched in 1989 that showed <laughs> this really cheesy example of like what your job was in the SEAL teams. Yep. And from what I understand, they initially, 
brought a company on board to make a 20 minute, you know, hey, this is what the SEAL teams is. And that company came on board and said, hey, we don't, you shouldn't just make a 20 minute video. You should make a, an actual feature film and we think we could do a great job with it. And for some reason, again, I don't know the backstory, leadership said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I don't know why they did that. Yep. I don't know if we were having problems recruiting. Um, I don't think we were having problems recruiting, but so I, at some point I'll dig and, and see what I can find out and see why, the, why that decision got made because it certainly was a complete departure from yeah. you know the way the way that I was certainly raised in the SEAL teams. When I was raised in the SEAL teams, it was like you didn't talk about it. You definitely like you. There was no stickers. Mm -hmm. There was no nothing. Well, that's just the way it was. And that was you know for me, man. When when I remember Leif and I who wrote Extreme Ownership with me, like the fr I, w I wish I would have recorded like the first call we had with our publisher. I was such a jerk <laughs> you know i was just like listen if this is gonna misrepresent this and all i, I was just it was because it was a huge like step right and it felt uncomfortable you know i had one of one of my friends who was an admiral was like he said something that i was very appreciative of which was hey we're we're quiet professionals, that doesn't mean silent professionals. And if you have important things that should be shared, then they should be shared. And I was like, well, okay. Now look, there's you can you can argue against that all day long. There's there's an easy to say, yep, that's bullshit and you shouldn't share anything. And that's absolutely a valid opinion. Uh, but that's the that's the direction that I went in. Like, hey man, when I was, I was working with these companies and these people were falling over themselves saying, this is such good information, thank you so much. And then it's like, well, we could really help out a lot of people if we do this. So there you go. And, it, and that's balanced against the fact that when you write a book that's about you, about, you know, yeah. I wrote a, you know, Leif and I wrote a 300 page book that's about us. And that's all, that's, that's all you need to say. Okay, so you're, you're to tooting your own horn or whatever the case may be. Yep. Yeah, that's there's no there's no denying it, and so you do the best you can. I did. I think we did the best we could to maintain like professionalism, humility. I mean, uh, the the things about you know um, as far as like classified material and stuff that wasn't even to me. That's a, just a non-starter, obviously. Yep, yep. Uh, and you know, for us, the combat that we were in was in front of the world it was yep. in daytime it was like there was no there was nothing secret about what we we're doing at all uh you know like we had when we had guys get killed it was in the newspaper the next day it wasn't some big secret their names like it was that's the way it was so we kind of felt like we were a little bit exposed anyways um but yeah it'd be interesting to find out and pull the thread on active valor and see what the what the thought process was behind that because i don't know even the way from what I've read, I think you guys are portraying in a great way and everything you're saying about like your experiences and what you're you're helping the world and giving back and, and giving some great leadership lessons and insight to at this point millions of people. Right. Um, but there's other guys who are not. There's other guys who are just talking and telling their story and just like um, some of these some of these cats will say I even look at. I look at what they're talking about and I look at where they're at in life and I'm like, dude, that was 15 years ago. That was 20 years ago. That's another reason why I'm like, hey, I've done, a, but I, you know, uh, this is a podcast, so of course we're going to talk about the past, but I'm like, hey, there's a lot I've done since then and, and I don't, I kind of view it as like, I don't want to be defined solely by then. I want to be defined what I've done since then. Yeah, well, I definitely have talked to a lot of people about the fear of becoming Uncle Rico yeah. Right? And being like, you know, the state championship, if I would have thrown the ball, I would have been good to go. I would have won the state. I would have gotten recruited. Like, hey, man, these are, these are, I learned some awesome lessons. We learned some awesome lessons, pass them on. But I mean, my life since I, I've been busier yeah, since yeah, yeah. I retired than I was when I was in. Yeah. Of, but, and you have a lot, you have a lot of, um, you've built a lot and you have a lot of stuff to talk about since then. Mm -hmm. I, I think some of these guys who are talking, and there's a lot of them, are, they don't have that that new experience even. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing too, though, in my situation, I also, I was in a very, people even ask me for transition advice sometimes, other team guys. And I'm actually the worst person 
to give that because my situation was super unique. The last three years, I was an instructor. Um, before I got out, uh, my ninth year to basically twelfth year, and I was working full time for CrossFit. Mm-hmm. And so here I was, I was, which is another reason you keep that stuff on the down low because <laughs> you would have gotten in all kinds of trouble. Uh, yeah, or maybe you had permission. I you had can't pr- get permission. I, yeah. I, I, informal permission, mm-hmm. let's say. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my leadership knew, but it wasn't formally written. Um, I was doing the CrossFit thing on the weekends because I had a fixed schedule and, and working for CrossFit, I'm sorry, in the Navy as an instructor. So I had to make a decision to uh, stay in. And if I stayed in, I'd go back and be operational and wouldn't be able to do the CrossFit thing or get out and work full time for CrossFit and and leave the Navy. And that was a tough decision to make because I loved, if I didn't have that CrossFit opportunity, I would have stayed in for 20 for sure. I'd have been retiring around this period. But so where I'm going with that is it's easy for me to sit up here and talk all fucking bold and like, yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna tell people what I did and where I was at because I had this nice transition. I had this huge buffer where I was able to get out and not, and I was getting out with a public persona and, and building a new, uh, working with a new company, building it up. My transition was one of a, it was super seamless mm-hmm. and, and not too, people don't get that chance too often. A lot of other guys like yourself, like you you got out at 20 and then kind of had to start your thing and chose the leadership route and kind of had to build everything from there. And like you said, capitalize on and acknowledge what you did for the last 20 years. I can't say I would not have done the same if I had to get out and didn't have... Um, didn't have CrossFit. Yeah. And so I do acknowledge that it was a unique situation for me. So I don't want to sound like I'm um, acting better than anyone else. It's just, it, and I don't, and honestly, like everyone, again, to the kind of the free speech thing, um, everyone's, they can pursue whatever they want, talk about it however they want, share, even though some of that stuff they shouldn't share, um, share what they've done. It's all, it's all good. I don't care too much at the end of the day. It's just not the, style I'm choosing yeah well and also there's just met market saturation at this point <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean yeah. like y- there's there's so many incredible stories of things that guys that things are things that guys have done from every branch of the service and there's a lot of it I mean 20 years of war you're gonna get some incredible stories you're gonna get some incredible lessons learned and that that's I think I think that's almost like a it's become a just a free market control is that oh yeah you can get out and talk about what you did in the green Berets or what you talked what you did in the seal teams or what you did in in marsoc or or whatever yep but if there's not something compelling there that's that brings something to the table for people then the free market will just kind of say hey thanks you know appreciate thanks for your service and and move on i th- and i think that's happened with a number of these books a number of these stories there's so many seal books out there not all of them are hitting anymore. Like you have to have, you have to have a compelling message. You have to have something with value that's going to make people really um, gravitate towards it and consume it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'd say there's no doubt about that. Uh, and we went down this little freaking tangent because I was like, okay, so what team do you go to? So you go to an East Coast team. How's your? How's your? How you like being a new guy? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. I. I mean, you don't, right? Like <laughs> being a new guy isn't an, an, a pleasurable experience. But um, even when I got two teams, I was kind of just staying in the middle, try to stay the, um, be the invisible man. But there it's, you quickly realize you have to, you can't, mm-hmm. you have to stand, you have to, cause it's such a smaller group. Yeah, cause it's you like have to new excel. guys up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're, you're in the, you're in the spotlight a um, majority of the time. Um, but, I was quiet and I was a really hard worker and I wanted, um, I wanted to prove myself I, even, even now, but even then I felt like I had something to prove. Even now I still feel like I have something to prove. And so working hard mattered and, um, and showing my leaders and not even my leaders, but the guy to the left and right of me that I was a good contributor and ultimately a good warrior meant a lot to me. And so I, I worked really hard and tried to, um, tried to excel at everything I did. Even though I wasn't winning everything I did, I tried to win everything I did. Mm-hmm. Well, people can tell when you're trying. 
Mm -hmm. And it's hard to win stuff when you're a new guy. Now, look, you might win a run. You might win a swim because you're coming out of buds. You're in good shape. But it's it's tough to beat a guy in shooting. It's tough to beat a guy in in anything tactical. But they can tell when you're when you're working hard. So this is still pre nine eleven, right? Yeah. And on that note, it's still pre nine eleven. And I I have a ton of respect for every SEAL, any, anyone in the military who um, enlisted after 9-11. Mm-hmm. I did not, you did not. We, we basically enlisted in peacetime. And um, I, I'd like to say, I mean, I think I would have. I, I know I would have, but it's still, it takes a little more mm-hmm. knowing that um, after 9-11, if you enlisted and came into these career fields, you were probably going to war. Yeah. And well, so, I did. T- technically, I thought I was going to Nam when I enlisted. <laughs> <laughs> and and I remember one of my buddies who also came to the teams. So what year was that? Nineteen ninety was when it, with a, okay. a guy that I went to Meps with. Yeah. And he ended up in the teams. Ended up a master chief. Just a freaking awesome guy. We were like riding the MEPS bus down to the airport and we're talking about, you know, he was a wrestler and so we're talking about, uh, I was like, you know, he, I think he said to me like, are you, are you trying for, are you trying for buds? And I was like, yeah, are you? And he's like, yeah. And of course there was, you know, a bunch of guys that were trying for buds, but, but uh, anyways, he had been to college Yep. and I, I was kind of like dumb and, but he was telling me, hey. You know, the casualty rate of SEALs is, I think it was him that told me this. The casualty rate of SEALs is like 50%. The chance of finishing a career at 20 years is like, it's almost nothing. And I was like, hell yeah, like we're going to war. I think he must have read that. And if again, if I'm putting this on this guy, I, I'm sorry, but some, I heard that rumor <laughs> in boot camp. I'm That's pretty sure awesome. it was him that was like, hey, it's really hard to retire as a SEAL because chances are you're just going to get killed. Yeah. And I remember being fired up about that. I was like, hell yeah. And then of course I got to, you know, SEAL Team 1 in 1991 and missed the first Gulf War and yeah, realized pretty quick I wasn't going to Vietnam. <laughs> but yes, these guys that were coming in post 9-11 and especially once it was really obvious that this was gonna be a long war. Like if you were enlisting in 2005, 2006, 2007, yeah, you knew what you were getting into. I remember Tim Kennedy saying that when he went to enlist on September 12th, like there's a line around the building. I remember I called the officer detailer and uh, on September 12th, you know, and I was in, the, the Navy had me in college at the time, and I was saying, hey, sir, you know, send me send me to the team right now, please. I'll, I'll graduate later. And he, he says, you know, hey, it's gonna be a long war, don't worry. But I was actually talking to him a, a couple of years ago, and he said, I was like, yeah, I remember calling you. He said, everybody called me. <laughs> and I was like, that's actually awesome. You know, that's exactly yeah, how yeah. you want it. Everybody in the teams wanted to go and fight. Did you do Seaman to Admiral or? Yes. Okay. Yep. So I did my first eight years at SEAL Team One, and then I got picked up for the Seaman Admiral program. I was in the second class of the Seaman Admiral program, and then went from Team One to OCS. E5 at Team One, OCS for 13 weeks, Ensign at Team Two. Damn. It was freaking awesome. Yeah. I didn't realize you were on the East Coast. Yep. Yep. Went to Team Two. Um, but that new guy experience that you had, I mean, I, you know, even though it's like, oh, there's nothing to, nothing to like about it, but damn, it's freaking awesome being a new guy in a SEAL platoon. Well, it's super formative. It's super like foundational to where you go and what you become and how you succeed or don't succeed in the community. And I think back to some of the mentors and the guys who really um, developed me at that point, they're tremendous in your life. They are super influential, again, in this notion of where you end up and what you become and what choices you decide to make. So I had some guys that I really respected that um, helped develop me and bring me along. So were you like a point man? I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like you'd guess you were a 60 gunner. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually a radio man. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That was, I signed up to be a radio man. I heard uh, an officer told me on quarter deck watch, he said, if you want to, if you want to go on every mission, you should be a radio man. And I was like, probably the only guy in the history of SEAL Team One that walked up to the radio room the next day and knocked on the door and said, I want to be a radio man. Like, no one ever wanted to be a radio man except for me. <laughs> so, uh, it was great advice, though. Uh, so you, you end up a point man, 
and then you're going on these are peacetime deployments you're yep. training people yep. you're doing exercises and all this kind of thing um september 11th comes how long did it take for you to go from peacetime deployments to wartime deployments much longer than i thought it would i think when it first went down we were all like oh shit here we go it's real we're gonna go to we're gonna go to war now mm-hmm. um at that period the especially with the the teams i was at the, it wasn't every seal team didn't push out and everyone even within a year afterwards it was very clear to get into combat that i had to make a few career choices career decisions and and basically put myself put myself out on the line kind of to to do that that i had to take a different step and so i did that and then i went to a team where okay it's real we're going to combat right away and um then did a few deployments, did multiple deployments, and went through that uh, phase. On that uh, 9-11, um, I remember I was in uh, Montana, and we were training the Blackfeet, uh, or we were training on the Blackfeet, uh, Blackfoot Reservation, Indian Reservation, and we were working with the BIA, the Bureau of Indian mm-hmm. Affairs. And we had gone to their facility, and I'll never forget this, it's so crazy, a few days before 9-11, we're looking at the FBI top 10 list, and I was just skimming it, and I saw Bin Laden, and it just stood out to me. I'm like, oh, look, Osama Bin Laden's on there. And I knew of him from the coal bombing mm-hmm. and that incident. And it was like that. I remember him and being on that FBI top 10 list standing out. And then a few mornings later, we were staying at a resort hotel. I remember walking into the lobby, and everyone huddled around the TVs, and that had just happened and seeing the planes hit the uh, towers and at that point you know it was still i think pretty quickly though within a week or two they tied it to him maybe even within a few days um, they tied it to bin laden i don't remember do you i don't remember when it got tied in i mean i remember the second plane hitting and it was like then it was real obvious yeah and i also remember hearing because i was not drawn to the TV, mm-hmm. and I was going. I was actually going to college at the University of San Diego, and I show up there, and I'm kind of listening to the radio, and there's some little something, you know, they're saying there's some news break. Oh, there's been a, a plane's hit the World Trade Center. I don't, you know, I figure a Cessna. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I just didn't. They, they didn't. They didn't make it sound like what it as big as it was, and so I, th- I'm going to class. I just turn off the radio, go to class. Like I thought it was just uh, Cessna hit the hit the tower. I get done with class, and I go to I actually go train jujitsu, and when I get to jujitsu, there, like no one at jujitsu watches TV. That's yeah. just like not happening. And I get to my jujitsu academy, and everyone's watching TV, and I'm like, "What is going on?" And sure enough, the second tower had been hit. And yeah, uh, next thing you know, I'm calling my detailer trying to figure out how I can get back to a SEAL team. Well, much later in the whole in in the conflicts, um, it, the more all teams are getting involved. I think in that first, um, like even. Um, that first call it three to five six period oh three or I'm sorry oh one to maybe four or five there was a small amounts of guys going out mm-hmm. especially once that racks um, popped up too then it's like all the teams were getting a lot of action yeah so in oh three I went to Iraq and in oh four my whole team showed up so I had one platoon in Iraq yep. in oh three yep and then in oh, I was at Team Seven, and then in, and then the whole team showed up. Yep, and it was like then that was it. From then on, the teams yes, rotated. The teams through. were rotating, and that but was like in the beginning when it was just Afghanistan. That definitely wasn't the case. Oh yeah, definitely not. Yeah, definitely not because it was a what, rapid the, deployment. What uh, period is this? Um, so most of the Battle of Ramadi that we talk about in that book is two thousand six. Okay, yep, two thousand six from. April until October 2006. Okay. And so I, we were, we were, um, anyways, over there with guys. I don't even know if, were you over there at that time? Were you in Iraq? Oh, at that six, time? I was back. I was not deployed. Okay. Yep. Um, so you're, we kind of already talked about the fact that you were in Afghanistan doing missions and you're, you're feeling good on the patrol in, you're feeling okay on the patrol out, but maybe on target you're feeling like maybe a little bit of lightweight. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So I'm doing a lot of training right now with, uh, we're working with General Donahue. He's a three-star in charge of 18th Airborne Corps. 18th Airborne Corps is 
hundreds of thousands. It's massive. And we, he's tasked us with, uh, he was in charge of 82nd Airborne before this post, 82nd Airborne. He's um, tasked us to do CrossFit training with um, 3rd Infantry, 3rd ID mm -hmm. in Fort Stewart. So we're conducting some training with their soldiers out there. And where I'm tying this into or why I brought that up is because same thing with here. Train, um, he said he was like training for an athletic contest. And even you reference to, and you hear a lot of the strength and conditioning coaches talk about how like um, our training should be more like athletes and um, professional athletes in general. It's actually fascinating because as I've thought about it, it's yeah, athletes and professional athletes specifically, the demands of their sport and their job are so clearly defined. I think we need to have a mental reset where no, we need to train like combat warriors and we need to be proud of that and we need to be proud that it's different than being a professional athlete because what we're training for you have no idea mm -hmm. what you're up against and and in this effort with the army hearing some of the other um, fitness specialists or fitness professionals and other soldiers talk about training like a professional athlete or training like an athlete it's it's actually the wrong perspective you should train like the the combat warrior or soldier that you are and be proud of that and that is a very different demand and requires very different skill sets than the clearly defined i mean even you take a fighter where they have great conditioning and they're um um great athletes they're pro athletes some of them they're the what they have to train for is in a box they understand three minute rounds or five minute rounds one minute rest um, and within that, they have to be incredibly capable, mm -hmm. obviously, but they don't need to train for five hours or they don't need to train for 48 hours out there. Um, the demands of a soldier, the demands of a warrior are everything and anything. Yep. It could be everything from a 13 kilometer patrol yep. one day rest for the day another 10 kilometers the next night you get on a target somewhere then you've got to kick open a door then you've got to haul some then you got to grapple with someone yep. then you got to lift that person into a v like there's there's such a unlimited variation that you can come up against that you really do have to train and prepare for that even though it's funny i was I have uh, one of my training partners, a guy named Miha. He's a you know really good jujitsu black belt, and for we, I've been training with him for the last six months or so, and we have been training the entire time with five minute rounds. That's just like our standard. You know, you get to want to roll with a bunch of different people, so we do the five minute rounds and all good. And we went on a trip. We went on a, we went on a trip, and all of a sudden it's just me and him, and we were doing no time limit rounds, just like we're training to submission, and. He mentioned it, you know, he got done. He's like, it's a lot different <laughs> when we're going with no time limit. And I was like, hey, I hadn't really thought about it, but I was like, oh yeah, there's a lot of, you know, all of a sudden it's not, the explosiveness is down, the endurance is up. Like it's a different strategy. It's different tactics and it's different even from a physical conditioning perspective. So then you take, that's just one element of combat. Now you take that and multiply yep. it times the infinite di different things that you can face and and you realize, man, you gotta, you gotta condition yourself. Like you said, it's not, it's not a sport. Yeah, no. A sport it, has not. rules. Yep, and then there's gotta be a, a mentality change and shift in, in a lot of the leaderships and soldiers who, who kind of say that. Because it's easy to default to that and it's easy to think, oh, we need these, this guy who, taught the um, Dallas Cowboys or the strength and conditioning coach from there. Like, yeah, those guys are well educated. They've trained professional athletes, but th that doesn't translate necessarily to working with warriors. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something very special. I want to ask you this about striking because you, you brought it up in general or fighting, I should say. Mm -hmm. I I'm a big believer that if I were to start someone from scratch now at this point to prepare for um, physical combat, I think striking is a good start to keep people away. Um, and then actually before jujitsu, I think learning judo and the skills of judo, trying to get people off and keep them away with prior to going to the ground actually creates a well-rounded, um, capable fighter. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I heard some quote recently and I actually covered on the podcast. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something along the lines of, if I have two hours to prepare you, yep, we're not even gonna talk about grappling. Yeah. 
if I have two weeks to prepare you, I'm gonna start to address it. If I have two years to prepare you, that's where I'm gonna start. Okay. Because it does take a lot longer to yep. learn. Yep. And um, you know, I always recommend if you're gonna commit to something and you're gonna train, you should start with jujitsu. The reason is because if you're if we're in a striking combat, if we're in a fight and you boxed and I didn't, I can run away from you. Yeah. If you want to kick me and you're a <laughs> kickboxer, I can run away from you. I don't have to actually fight you until you grab a hold of me. Yeah. And then my kicking doesn't work, my punching doesn't work. What works is grappling. What works is jujitsu. And if you wrestled and I didn't wrestle, you're gonna take me down. Like to this day, like I didn't wrestle in high school. Yep. If somebody wrestled in high school, they're gonna take me down. Yep. That's what's gonna happen. Like you they spent four years. Yeah. You know, it's three like hours. The swimming the, thing. Yeah, it's kind of like the swimming thing. Yep. So they're going to get the takedown. So what I have to get good at is I have to get good at jujitsu. I have to get good at, from a self defense perspective, getting back up off the ground, getting away from them, breaking contact. So that's what that that's how I would answer that question. Uh, judo is great. Judo is great. The throws in judo are great. The, they rely on the, the the takedowns in wrestling. Comprehensively, are more reliable. But if it's pure self-defense and you know a good judo throw, man, that's really good. People, you're dealing with somebody that's got clothes on. You can grab a hold of their clothes. There's no grabbing clothes in wrestling. Yeah. That means also if I have to grab clothes and the clothes aren't there, my, my moves don't work if I'm a, rest, if I'm a judo player. So being well-rounded, it, it almost goes back to the same theory of fitness, which is being well-rounded and having an open mind and being decent at a lot of different things is probably going to be better than being an expert in one thing. And that was really proven out in the early UFCs, which is this guy that's a pure boxer is losing to, you know, Hoist Gracie. This guy that's a pure Taekwondo is losing to a wrestler. You would see that these purists and then the pure wrestler is losing to the jujitsu guy. The jujitsu guy was the most rounded at the time. Yep. And if you take just pure one sport or one technique or one art versus one other art, jujitsu clearly was the winner. That's that's been proven. So that being said, nowadays you have to learn everything, yeah. and you want to learn everything. So, you know, when when we were dealing with combatives in the SEAL teams, one of the arguments that got I got told about certain systems was, "Hey, you know, jujitsu takes too long to learn. MMA takes too long to learn. We only can train these guys for five days or seven days or two weeks, so we have to give them something that's going to help them immediately." And I said, "Hey." How long have you been in the teams for? Nine years, 12 years, seven years. I go, hey man, you don't have two weeks to learn how to fight and you can't learn how to fight in two weeks. You, you have a career to learn how to fight. So learn how to fight and yep. then you'll be much, much better off. And to some degree, combatives and the fight in general, um, there's a, obviously a lot of skill that comes with it, but um, there's a warrior mindset Absolutely. And like a uh, perspective that this guy in front of me is not going to stop me and I'm going to fucking go through him or do whatever it takes. And it might not uh, express in the perfect technique and the perfect form, but there's an aggression that I saw that I think sometimes even trumps a lot of the traditional training. You think of some of the guys that we fucking worked with, guys bigger than you, guys as big as you that weren't as well trained as you in combatives, but still beasts and still able to muster up the fight and the aggression to take anyone out. Yeah, no, there's there's a, a level of just being aggressive that is gonna be very, very helpful yep. in a combat situation. Especially with a lot of the people we would come across, meaning probably not trained. <laughs> exactly, yep. like it's, you come up against a 160 pound, you know, 43 year old Iraqi dude, like you're 227 yep. pound, Freaking seal that can bench 380, like, and his and he's hostile, yeah. <laughs> dude. He's gonna bring it. That dude, yeah. that 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 Iraqi doesn't. He's not gonna cause much of a problem. Now that being said, I saw with my own eyes guys getting guys having problems controlling yeah. Iraqis. 
Yep. Uh, yep. I, I saw that with my own eyes. I mean, one of the very first like times I was out in Iraq, 2003, and we were doing a vehicle interdiction, and we we get this vehicle pulled over, and I'm the ground force commander, so I'm kind of like, you know, got, got my gun at high port. I'm kind of observing the whole situation, making sure everything's cool, and all of a sudden, I hear this guy calling for help, like a SEAL, and I'm like, this is weird. So I walk over and sure enough, he's in a he's in hand to hand combat with like a fifteen year old kid. <laughs> and he's not winning. <laughs> yeah. And so I go over and it takes me two seconds to get the guy under control and get 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 it solved, but he was panicked. The fifteen year old kid was panicked. He doesn't know what the hell's going on. So he's freaking out. He's do you get that pain like we used to hear pain compliance? Pain compliance also causes pain non-compliance because if you start torquing on my wrist or torquing on my shoulder, I get, I react to it. And my reaction might seem like hostility to you. So then you apply more pressure. That makes me fight even harder. And next thing you know, we've escalated the situation. Yep. The One of the good things about training combatives all the time, jujitsu, boxing, Muay Thai, wrestling, all that stuff is that you are very used to physical con- confrontation. It happens to me every single day. Like an hour before you got here, I had a bunch of savage dudes trying to choke me, right? Grabbing my neck, grabbing my arm, trying to knock me down to the ground. But that's what I do every day. Yep. And when you get used to that, it just becomes very, very natural. Much like you already pointed out the example of someone that swims. Like yep. this dude, no fence. Yeah. And that guy passed pool comp easily and he's not freaking out. You take some kid from Iowa that didn't spend much time in the water, they get in the water, they freak out. Yep. So doing this stuff regularly is extremely important. You know, the, uh, that's another thing with like parachuting, right? I would use the comparison, like who does better? Well, if you're getting, if you, be, if you get into sport parachuting, right? You get really good at sport parachuting. And then guess what? When you put on a ruck and a weapon, it's not like, oh, now you're all confused because you got a ruck and a weapon on. No, those people that are sky gods yeah. and have 6,000 civilian jumps, they have 6,000 civilian jumps, you can put anything on them. And they know how to handle it, they make it happen. It's not like they go, ah. yeah. no. Uh, same thing with. Well, same thing with sport shooting. I was and, about to say. And you know what, so I've since I got out of the teams, I became an avid shooter. And I shoot in a lot of different disciplines and that's, that's my passion now. So I spend a lot of my off time um, competing in shooting sports. And in the teams, when I was, at least when I was coming up and especially on the East Coast, there was no culture for, for uh, pursuing the shooting sports outside of, um, of being a team guy and, um, and the training that we did. The Army guys, some of the Army guys I saw, th- they actually had a pretty good culture of competing outside of, um, of work in some of these civilian competitions. And to this day, they still do. I've actually recently worked with um, guys from one and a few other uh, teams down here in trying to help them, expose them more to the civilian competition world. Because if you're shooting civilian competitions, you are way better than everyone else who's shooting uh, just in the teams. And I think that our operators aren't fighting enough. Like you said, they're not making that a premium and they're not shooting enough. Yep. And um, those two things, pursuing it. But it's also like, it's so easy to say from the outside, but it's also like, hey, our time is so precious and asking someone to shoot on the weekend, mm-hmm. you know, that's a, a, they're taking away from an already really, or taking their time away from their family with an already really busy schedule. But um, because when I first got out, I, I mean, I'd, accomplished a lot in the military. I worked with some of the best units. I was a, su- uh, a good shooter. And then I went and shot some civilian competitions and I failed. I mean, I finished like at the very bottom mm-hmm. and I saw how slow I was. Mm-hmm. So my eyes were opened and I'm a huge believer. It's just like the sport parachuting right. aspect. Right. Like you pursue that stuff a little bit on the side and you're going to make yourself a much better warrior and prepared for combat. Yeah. Like you are a lead climber. Yeah, exactly. So you're a lead climber when you're out climbing uh, El Cap, are you wearing all your gear for combat? No, but when you're now in combat and you got your gear on and you have to figure out some kind of a problem, you're gonna be infinitely better. And some people used to say, we're gonna get bad habits. Do you remember that? <laughs> that was one of the things, you're gonna get bad habits, you're gonna get bad habits. And I was like, man, if you're that good at civilian shooting, yep. those 
bad habits that you have are just going to be nothing. They're going to be they're 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 going to be good. I, I think we um, and I, actually it's interesting. I think you learn skills to apply to different scenarios. Meaning, what be, can be called a bad habit. Um, well, in the sport, let's say you're. Um, you're drawing from the side and you're engaging and then you're holstering without sweeping right, left right, and right. right. And that would be considered a bad habit. When you get to the environment or the training environment with the SEAL teams where you have to uh, look left and right, you'll know to do that. Yeah. Like you're smart enough and trained enough to adapt to different situations with different skill sets from the same realm. Yeah. Meaning there's a lot of different techniques. It's like, it's like um, well, to go back to the climbing stuff too, for ascending a rope, there's um, people would say, okay, so you use this Prusik knot and then you tie here and you create this system and you ascend a line. And I would, I would, I learned early on, don't learn the knot, learn the system. Learn, okay, you need a friction knot here. Not necessarily a Prusik. Mm -hmm. There's probably five different fr uh, friction knots you can apply to this scenario. So even to these days, and the same probably same of jujitsu. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways to tackle a single problem. Uh, obviously, in the beginning, it might make sense to teach one, but then you have to educate conceptually. I need to build a toolbox to, in, in leadership too. Mm -hmm. Same sort of principle. And so this is sort of the attitude that opened your mind to CrossFit. Absolutely. And for me, again, <laughs> I was watching an old clip that we recorded on this podcast a long time about, about CrossFit. Somebody had asked me, like, what do you think of CrossFit? And I actually compared, oddly enough, I actually compared CrossFit with the Gracie family. Because if the Gracie family didn't exist, we would not have the UFC. We would not have mixed martial arts. We would not have this incredible progress and open-mindedness that has now become the core belief inside of mixed martial arts. Anyone that's a mixed martial artist right now, which pretty much if you train martial arts now, you're a mixed martial artist, your premise is there's gonna be new things that work, there's gonna be some things that don't work. If something works, it's good. If it doesn't work, it's bad. If it doesn't work, we don't throw it away, but we definitely are gonna consider what the benefits are and when is the appropriate time for it. But the key component being my mind is open to, yes. to what is happening. I looked at you know CrossFit. Now, I was a, a, an odd person that had always kind of been into strongman, Olympic lifting. I do, now, I never had an Olympic lifting coach. I wish I would have. They didn't exist. Yeah. When I, you know, there's a, a magazine called Milo. I've been a, I was a subscriber for Milo from like 1994, I think is when I have my first copies. I still have them. And in there, they had Olympic lifting. They had strongman. They had powerlifting. They had those things in there. And so I knew about them, but I, like me doing a clean and jerk, you know, was an embarrassment <laughs> to the to the world of technique, but I knew about it. I knew about it. No, there wasn't a there wasn't a place to learn clean and jerk in San Diego. There wasn't an Olymp. There wasn't bumper plates no. in San Diego. There wasn't bumper plates at the SEAL teams. Nope. So CrossFit came in. And, and actually, I remember, is I, the reason I asked you the date when you were researching it, you were researching about it. So I was on deployment in 2003. And remember I said my, my, the whole team showed up, including my commanding officer. And he, I'm pretty sure he's the guy that said to me, hey, have you heard of this stuff? And I was like, no, and I started looking at it. And I said to him, hey, newsflash. If you pick up heavy stuff yeah, and you yeah. do it over and over again, you're gonna get stronger and you're gonna get in better shape. I acted like this was common sense. And it was a little bit of common sense to me, but I don't wanna give myself too much credit. I'm not trying <laughs> to say, I'm definitely not trying to say I, I had that, but like, like. But I, let me say one piece you're not saying, but you understood in, uh, inherently, and, and what's one of the reasons why CROSS is so effective is the intensity aspect of 100%. it. hundred percent. And picking up heavy shit under intensity and intensity in CrossFit translates to the things being timed. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to say this. Interestingly enough, nowadays, especially with even some spec operators or some pro athletes, intensity is incredibly vulnerable. Intensity, you see it in fighting. I mean, you, you're, mm -hmm. you have to be... Um, 
if you don't have intensity, you're going to get choked out. But in, in training, people are now doing the movements but taking the intensity out because they don't want to be exposed. They don't want to be seen training under duress or uh, snot coming out, <laughs> screaming, making, you know, shaking. And no, it, you can't scream anymore. That's when you're really there is when there's no more noise to be made. You got nothing left. So, so the intensity piece too is what you were yep. talking about in the very beginning. Yep. So. Yeah, and, and that, so, so CrossFit comes in. So when did you, when did you, so it was 2003, 2004, that's when you actually started doing it? So uh, probably four, five, I was doing it. And then in, in um, six or seven, six, I was in Monterey and I uh, started working out with, or I knew CrossFit was based out of um, Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And so I started going over there, met Glassman, mm -hmm. started, introduced myself to him and just started uh, training with them. Mm -hmm. And that's- Were so, you going to school in Monterey? Where yeah, you DLI. Oh, okay, right on. Yep. And so that's how I, um, that's how I was connected to Glassman. He'd always been super welcoming of um, military guys, especially at that time. And so he found out I was in the Navy, let me train there for free, started inviting me to events, started. Uh, was this the actual Santa Cruz gym? Yes, yep, the, that actual original gym. Started, um, offered me a spot at a level one seminar. I went to the level one seminar with a few other um, SEALs. Then he asked for me to um, attend some and help out. And so I started going to them and helping out as an instructor. And what's interesting at this point, so this is six, seven, there were a handful of other team guys that were yep. from West Coast that were in that same Glassman circle, kind of um, um, working with him mm -hmm. and part of his little crew, I'll say. And, and this is 06, 07? Yeah. And yeah. so 06 for sure. And I... Um, so my, I'm pretty sure my assistant platoon commander who was with me when my CEO said like, hey, what do you think of this stuff? And I was like, hey, lift stuff, go hard. You're gonna get in better shape. Like, he was my workout buddy. Mm -hmm. We were doing all kinds of stuff. Like, he, he was doing the 20 rep squats with me. Yeah, like, we yeah, were getting, yeah. like, he's a freaking, you know, a badass yeah. athlete. And we, 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 were, we were getting after it. And then when we got back, he, I think he went to Bud's as an instructor. And so, that's why he had time mm -hmm. to go and yep. start to get engaged with CrossFit. Well, we ended up having lunch, uh, maybe in eight or nine, with Glassman and Nicole Carroll. Okay. So yeah. we had lunch at um, Coronado Brewing Company. Okay. And I think that's the first time I met you, and I'd known of you. I was still an instructor at that point. And uh, yeah, the four of us sat down. I remember that lunch for some reason. I don't remember yeah, what we yeah, talked yeah. about, but we hung out. Yeah. Yep, um, and that's why, so I was gonna ask you this, so I went to a level one certification for the teams. Yep. I think it might've been the first one that you guys put on? It was pre-me for sure. Okay. So I was, Greg, they were doing seminars before I was coming around. Got it. Yeah, so they were doing those uh, level ones before I was coming around, and then I got involved. And what's interesting in that, the, the, <laughs> the life lesson and the, the thing I talk to people about from my experience in my engagement with CrossFit at that stage, I'd accomplished a lot in the military. I had, you know, done a full spectrum of things. I was at the top of the tip of the spear, call it for who we were. And um, here I was kind of introduced to a new community, introduced to a new um, almost opportunity, job opportunity. And there was a couple of different paths to go. One was sitting there and being like, well, I'm a SEAL. I've done this. I'm, I'm good. Just like ramp me up to the front of the line mm -hmm. and or just fucking buckling down and getting to work. And I, I took this perspective of everything I every and I tell guys this now, everything you did in the past is significant and it's foundational and it's 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 um, it's very it's why you are who you are and it's taken you to multiple levels. But once, and it'll open a lot of doors for you. But once those doors are opened, you have got to start over. You've got to prove value and show who you are here and now and stop leaning on the past, stop living in the past. And so that's kind of was my 
uh, my way of operating when I first got involved in CrossFit, I was fucking taking the trash out. And I was setting up chairs. And here I was. I'd been in the Navy for nine, ten years at that point. And again, uh, accomplished a, an immense amount of things where I, I could be proud of everything and not uh, not take trash out ever mm-hmm. again or not set up chairs. But I started from the bottom and just went in with like, okay, I'm the new guy. I'm a new guy again. Mm-hmm. And um, that attitude was really for me in – getting through and it, call it advancing and getting more opportunities with CrossFit was um, significant and it was very powerful. And, and it's something that I like to tell guys, hey, man, don't just be super humble, mm-hmm. no, regardless of what you've done in the past. Two things. Number one, my first uh, seminar. I, knew, I feel like I kind of knew what was up a little bit. I was heads up. Kind of was talking to me like, hey, no. I remember had the old school um, uh, PVC homemade yeah. rings. Yep. And he goes, he's like, oh, you got to try a muscle up. And I was like, what is it? He goes, oh, it's like this. And I and I remember thinking to myself, I got to do this right. Like it's just me and him. <laughs> me and him are hanging out. And the first try, I got it. I was like, oh, <laughs> I, totally bad technique. But what I realized was like, oh, there's there's things going on here. So I remember I was at that. That level one. Was thing. it in Ramona? No, it was at the teams. San- okay. Oh, okay. They did one for you there. Yep. 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 So. What year? I don't know. Okay. It's around this time frame. It's around when. I, I might have been involved with that one. Yeah. You. It might have been. I, it seems like maybe that's why we were at lunch. Yeah. Because yeah, we. That might have been. Because we did a few seminars at the teams there. Yeah. Um, by the time I was coming around. Yep. So. I remember thinking, this is a trick. N- not, not in a bad way, but I remember at the first UFC, it was 1993, I already knew jiu-jitsu. I, I knew Hoist Grace who was gonna win that thing. They start saying like, hey, who wants to do, you know, whatever? Who, wants to, who thinks they can lift 95 pounds? It's like, I see a couple team guys raising their hand, I'm like, this is a setup, dude. Yeah, <laughs> You're getting yeah, set up. Yep, yep. Who wants to go against Nicole with this? And yep. I'm like, dude, you guys are getting set up. You guys are, you guys are getting smoked. You're gonna get crushed right now. So I kind of knew what was up. I knew to keep my freaking mouth <laughs> shut. Yep. Uh, because if you don't train in those modalities, you're gonna be, you're gonna get caught totally off guard. And well, and a lot of the movements, um, especially the ones they put guys up against Nicole, specifically the overhead squat, the flexibility yeah, demand that th- they're not there for for a lot of guys unless you've been training like this unless you're olympic weightlifting and or crossfitting your shoulder mobility probably isn't there to have the bar in a optimal position to do high reps to do with 27 yes, reps exactly and while you're face to face with nicole yeah right exactly. which is what you, which is what you're getting yourself into yep and this was it got, honestly it was like uh it was like the first ufc because People just didn't know. People just didn't know, and they were like, "Oh, I got. The, I can squat 380. What? This girl's gonna beat me? No way! Give me that ball. 95 pounds? Are you kidding me?" Yeah. And I was like, "Dude, this is a, you're about to get Fed choked up. out, <laughs> choked out physically uh, in the in the physical realm." But but what what an eye opener, right? Yeah. What an eye opener to say, "Oh, there's a little bit of a dip. There's more to this than just how much can you squat? You know, what's your shoulder mobility? What's your hip mobility? What's your ankle mobility? Where are you at?" And do you have it? And by the way, if you can't do that, what else can't you do? Where else are you falling short? And a muscle up is another great example. Like, isn't it a very important skill to be able to take yourself, your body weight, and pull yourself up, not just up to the bar, but above the bar? Yep. That seems like, it doesn't take a genius to go, "Mm, that seems like it might be a really good skill to have. I should be able to do that. And there's some technique to it, and there's some strength to it, and there's some flexibility to it. And I don't have those things, and I better figure them out right now. Because I'll tell you what, I did that one, well, the first time I ever did a muscle up, I did one, thank God I didn't get asked to do another one, because who knows what would have happened. <laughs> so that's what I saw. So as you go up to Santa Cruz, and you're just getting annihilated in workouts, you know, and you're just thinking, what is going on? How, how well, they, they got me actually with Nicole early on. One of my first oh, sessions ever. Yeah, they got, they got me. They got me. <laughs> One of my first sessions ever at um, the CrossFit Santa Cruz, I went to an evening class and um, they get us in a big circle and they're warming us up and they warmed us up for um, the push jerk. 
And I didn't have, I had been doing CrossFit now for probably eight or nine months, but I didn't, never coached. And so didn't, still doing a lot of these movements poorly. And um, they're like, all right, now we're going to break up into groups and we're going to do this for, I think it was a one rep max load. And so they had four platforms out in the gym. It's a small gym. And they go, okay, this, this platform is going to have um, the ladies. They're going to gravitate towards uh, that group. This platform is going to have the stronger ladies of the class. This platform is going to have the men. This platform's going to have the stronger men. And I go, okay, cool. I start walking over to the stronger men platform. And uh, the guy goes, no, 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 you're going to go to this fifth platform that was no one was at yet. And I was like, oh, don't you think I should lift with the dudes? And they're like, no, 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 go to this platform. And then, I see, <laughs> and then I see this 130-pound-year-old female putting a bar on there, and she's, like, tiny. And um, I go, hey, man, I don't know about this. I shouldn't be lifting with a female. I should be lifting with the guys. And the trainer's like, no, 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 lift with her. I'm like, all right, maybe they just want you know her to have someone to <laughs> show her how it's done. Uh-huh. And so we start barbell, warm up a couple reps. The 25s go on, do some at 95. Then the 35, uh, 45s go on, and we're 135. And I look around, <laughs> and like all of the other groups, the men, one group of men are at 145, the other's not. The women are not even close to that. And we're knocking out one uh, some reps at 135. And then she's adding more weight and more weight. And her form is impeccable the entire time. We get to 165, 175. And again, that's not a lot, but I wasn't, I'm not a big guy. And at that time, I was new to these movements. I hit whatever, 175. And I'm like, oh, that was tough. <laughs> and then she hits it, no problem. No and I'm factor. like, ah, oh, I was like, this was a fucking setup. Yeah. And then uh, we go to 185 and I miss it. And she gets under it and nails it. And we didn't talk to each other a single mm-hmm. moment. And was that. this Nicole? Yeah, this was the same, oh, yeah. the one they You're set up. you shut down. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she got- crushed me. And uh, I left that gym calling guys back on the East Coast saying, I fucking should turn in my trident. I just got destroyed by a, by a female on a barbell movement. But that, and, that's CrossFit. And just like jujitsu, just like jujitsu, there's people that get choked out by the 150-pound girl and they never come back. And their ego is so destroyed that they think, oh, this is a, if this was a real fight, I would have done this. And you think, you know, well, if this was a real situation, I'd just pick her up and throw her to the ground. Instead of going, damn, I got some weaknesses I need to work yeah, on. And absolutely. that's the difference. It's, it's, very, it's a humbling experience. Just like jujitsu is a humbling experience, CrossFit is a very humbling experience. And you'll see people doing movements that they've, that they've trained in. Yeah, that's why the, it's also similar to jujitsu is like, oh, the reason the 150 pound woman choked you out isn't because she's a better human being than you. It's because she's trained for that. Yep. The reason that Nicole beats you in clean and press or whatever it was movement you were doing isn't because she's a better human being than you. It's because she's trained in it. Well, you know, to that same note, I would hear guys talking about the shooting stuff again. Be like, oh, like we'd hire external experts, shooting experts, to um, to work with us. And like, oh, those guys shoot all the time. That's why they're good. Exactly. <laughs> but like, yeah, like that's not an insult. Like, w- but people would say it as an yeah, insult. Yeah, yeah. Like he shoots all the time, so he's really good. Well, yes, you you guys roll all the time, so you're really good. That's part of being yep. really good. I, I <laughs> tapped a guy out one time who was a team guy, and I was bigger than him and stronger than him. And I tap him out, and he goes, you never would have got that if you weren't so strong. And I said, that's why I lift, motherfucker. (laughs) (laughs) I also wanted to say this, like uh, you said it a while ago, you were talking about the fact that we don't shoot enough. They shoot a lot more now in the teams. They're they're doing way better and they they do more combatives, way more. Good, good. Across the board, they're just gonna be better. They're gonna be better SEALs than we were because they're just, they got it, they got it on tap. The shooting? And the fitness, um, less so with the combatives, but you might you might argue with this or you might have an answer that I'm not thinking of, but it needs to be measured. And what I mean by the standards, like shooting, there needs to be time mm-hmm. in everything. If you're unless and same with fitness, unless you're putting it out there and competing and actually, okay, what's your draw from a holster with retention? If you guys are just going through the motions and not actually measuring it and pushing it and trying to get faster, it's still great. Right. Yep. Don't get me wrong. Yep. But that's the thing that takes it to the next level. Same thing with CrossFit. The fittest guys and the fittest people are doing it under a stopwatch. And actually, there's a ceiling for intensity that we're all capable of. 
and they're actually training there and pushing it and hitting on that ceiling and you keep hitting it and you raise it. If you don't train with intensity and hit that ceiling at all, you're never going to raise that ceiling. So the question then from that is back to the combatives part. How do you measure and how do you... Um, you do what the U.S. Army does. Okay. You have a massive combatives tournament. You have combatives tournaments on bases. You have compete, yep. people train. Yep. And you can make it like, hey, you will compete in this. And that way you know who's training and who's not training. And I think that's a great way that they do that to get people to train. Because if you're training, you're going to know. Yeah. And if you're not training, yeah, you're going to get crushed. So. Yep. It's very cool the way the Army sets that up. I don't know if the Marine Corps has those. I don't know why I'm looking at you, Echo, but I don't know if the Marine Corps has the, has those combative tournaments the way the Army does. The Army has legit combative Well, the Marine Corps tournaments. has the Marine Corps. What's it called? McMap. McMap, And then yeah. you advance through that system, yep. so you get, like, belts in their system. What do you think of that? I th I'm happy that people are training. Yeah. I'm overjoyed that people are training. If you take a Marine that knows McMap compared to a Marine that doesn't, that Marine that knows McMap is going to win 10 to 10, nine times out of 10, if not 99 times out of 100. So I'm glad that they're training. Uh, you know, and I, look, belts to me and that kind of stuff, I, I'm, they're never really, I've never really been that super into them. Uh, I know why little kids, why it's cool, little kids like belts. You know, little kids want to get stripes on their belts and they want to get that next color belt. I get it. And, and adults too. You know, there's some adults that, that they get some, some goal accomplishment, right? Which is fine. So I think if it helps people train, good. But that's easy coming from the super black belt over here. Easy for him to say at this <laughs> yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. I can say I never, I, even when I wasn't a black belt. How long did it take you to get the black belt? 10 years. Damn. Yeah. Hey, I respect the shit out of jujitsu jiu and their path towards excellence and how they give away, they give belts or not yeah. give away, how you earn a belt. Yeah. Because it takes a tremendous amount of effort and commitment. And, and I, th especially in the traditional martial arts, that, that's not there. Yeah. I mean, you get people getting belts in Taekwondo in a few years. Yeah. When they're nine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is, which is unfortunate. Um, at this point, so, so when did you actually, leave the Navy. What year was that? Um, 09. And so I had um, been working for CrossFit for about three years at that point and an instructor at BUDS. And that's where I had to make... Were you a BUDS instructor or SQT instructor? SQT. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. but it was under BUDS at that yeah, time. Yeah. That's why I say that. Um, I had to make a decision and stay in. Again, if I was going to stay in, I was going to end up going back to being operational and I wouldn't have been able to do the work I was doing for CrossFit or get out and work full time for CrossFit. And you got to understand at that point in 09, CrossFit was already like blowing up. Mm -hmm. Like the games had been around for three years. Uh, our number of seminars were exploding. The number of affiliates were exploding. Um, I was already becoming like a figure in the community. And so, and honestly, if, uh, financially, I was able to take care of my family much better if I pursued the CrossFit route mm -hmm. and didn't do the Navy thing. So it was a tough decision. And and I will say this about the time, being saying I don't talk a lot about stuff, I will acknowledge this story. Shortly before getting out, I called one of my old team leaders from the East Coast, and uh, I said, hey, are you guys pumping out anytime soon? And he said, yeah, we are. I'm like, I want to come with you. And so I asked the leadership, I'm like, hey, can I go on a, on a little deployment? And they said, yep. And so I hadn't signaled to the Navy or anyone at this point that I was getting out. But a few months before I got out, I was fortunate enough to um, push over with my, with my old group and um, do a last deployment to Afghanistan. That was pretty fucking cool. And it was unique because, and this is a unique piece that really nobody knows. I was overseas planning the CrossFit Games and um, planning seminars for CrossFit from Afghanistan, from internet we had hijacked from um, some local Brits. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, then I came, and it was honestly, again, I couldn't signal or tell anyone I was doing that because they probably not, would have not let me, they wouldn't have let me do that. Um, but I came back and was like, okay, now I'm done. Like mm -hmm. I, I have it out of my you system. You got it out of your system. Yeah, and I needed that one last touch point to know I could walk away from it. Now, um, 10 years later, no, 14 years later, I made the right decision, but sometimes I'm like, man, I, should, I wish I would have stayed in. Mm -hmm. Like, and especially as the, year, if I've, have, as the years have passed, I've really like appreciated what I did and who I worked with and wish I would have um, done it longer. But it, 
the, the outcome would have never, that was the right choice at the right time. I actually say Glassman saved my life because I do think, especially, you know, the deal, doing the stuff we do and the number of times you go overseas, it's, it's, it's ultimately becomes a numbers game. Mm-hmm. And so by giving me the opportunity to get out and do this, um, I feel like I do say that honestly, like he saved my life. But I loved it, and I miss it. And again, as time has gone on, I really wish I would have stayed in longer. When I got, I got fired a year and a half ago, two years ago, whenever it was, when I got fired, the first thing I did is I texted one of my buddies on the East Coast and said, hey, you guys need a shooter? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he thought I was joking. I was actually kind of serious. But um. uh, Yeah, so timing-wise, I was looking at the, the history. Um, 2000, in the year 2000, CrossFit was, was incorporated. In 2001, the first gym opened. In 2005, there was 13 CrossFit gyms. Yeah, nuts. Victory, which is my gym, we started our CrossFit affiliate in 2007. I want to find out what number we are. Oh, we can find that out I, for sure. Yeah, it, I mean, that's pretty good to go. And then there was top, probably top two or three hundred for sure. It, it might have been. Yeah. Um, and again, this is like pr- probably right oh, after we're seven. doing these things. Yep. Yeah. It was late 2007 because we opened our doors opened here January 2nd, 2008. Okay. But we had everything Maybe good to go in 2007. Yeah, I yeah, think it is higher yeah, than 200. Yeah. Uh, by 2013, there's 8,000 gyms. There's an over 10,000 gyms right now. So, so in 2009, this thing is blowing up. Yes. CrossFit's totally blowing up. Um, you decide to get out, and you're, you. What was your job? Well, at that point, I was running the seminar department, the training department, actually with Nicole Carroll, and I was running the CrossFit Games. So, I had created the CrossFit Games. The first three games, seven, eight, and nine, were on the family ranch that I grew up on, uh, the CrossFit Ranch, and they. Um, after that, we ended up 2010, we had to move them out because the county kicked us out. <laughs> but so I was in charge of the games and um, in charge of the seminar department. Two of the, there was three large sectors or departments at the time of CrossFit. It was training, um, affiliates, and then the games. And so two of the three I was in charge of, which was, and again, that's a super unique opportunity. And and especially well, both of them, it's kind of like, I just, um, a lot of the hard work I put in and a lot of, I laid the foundation to do that. Mm-hmm. I laid the foundation, worked hard and kind of, I don't want to say, um, well, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, being a SEAL though, I acknowledge and respect opened the door and opened the opportunity to be close to the um, leadership crew there. And then once that happened, I had to capitalize on it. Yep. And essentially did. Yeah, you know, that's something I, I, when we were talking about this earlier, the, the being a SEAL, people, people respect that. Yep. And they say, oh, you were a SEAL. That means you're a hard worker. That means you're disciplined. That means you've been in pressure situations. I would more, I'm, let, come, come work for me. Yep. So that door was open. Yep. Now, all those things that I just said about being a SEAL, have various varying degrees of being true, yep. right? You might not necessarily be a hard worker. You might not necessarily <laughs> be disciplined. You might be a terrible leader. There's terrible leaders in the SEAL teams. There's people that have n- terrible judgment and they were SEALs. So the door, there's a lot of doors that absolutely get opened up, but once you get inside, you, you, you're gonna have to prove yourself. And yep. that goes back to what you said earlier, just being humble and working hard and keeping an open mind is going to be the way to be successful. Yep. If you think you can ride being a SEAL, the, 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 what is it on the movie Elf? The, the Santa Claus meter? You know, not tracking me over here? No. The spirit I, meter. The spirit meter for being a SEAL only lasts so long that it burns out and people are like, hey, you actually have a job to do. Are you yep. going to be able to do this? Yep. And if you can't, you're yep. not, not going to go very far. You obviously proved yourself. You're working hard. You end up running these two big portions of it and CrossFit starts to go Richter. Now, with popularity comes heat seeking missiles from all directions. And um, so CrossFit was the target of a lot of criticism. 
um, like early on and right away. And what's crazy about that, people ask me like how I deal with some of the stuff now at this point, some of the public stuff. And I'm like, man, I've been dealing with this for over 15 years mm -hmm. and like early eight, nine time frame, like you're already seeing personal, I'm already seeing personal attacks. Mm -hmm. I'm already seeing people um, online trashing and destroying CrossFit, trashing and destroying me. And then as it just got larger, that just scaled up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it just scaled. You know, I, I find that a lot of times when people are being critical of things, my general attitude is to say, well, they're, they're probably right about something here. Like if somebody says that I like uh, am doing something that doesn't seem to make sense, my initial reaction isn't, no, they're wrong. My initial reaction, okay, well, what am I doing that's not making sense? And it seems like that attitude is a good attitude to have as opposed to getting super defensive and saying, no, I'm actually perfect. <laughs> and why are you questioning everything that I do? Do and people come at you at all? I, they're all afraid of you. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, an odd thing. Um, no, no I, I think it's because um, I would say I'm more, I, I think because I am open-minded about things that I'm not probably not the funnest target to attack. You know, if you say I'm not a great SEAL, I'd be like, yeah, I definitely wish I was a better SEAL. If you say I'm not that good at jujitsu, I would say, yeah, I definitely am not that good at jujitsu. If you say I'm not that strong, I would say I'm certainly not that strong. If you say I'm not that smart, I'd say you're right, I wish I was smarter. So it's probably not that fun to come at me because I don't, you're probably right. If you're finding fault with me, I'm gonna say you're, you're in fact, you are right. So when people have negative things to say about me, they're probably, they, they are correct. And I nod my head and think about how I can get better. And I think that, you know, is a, is a positive thing to do and it helps to not feel um, you know like you're being ripped apart when I just feel like I'm getting good constructive criticism <laughs> from the world sometimes which is okay uh, and I think you know some of the criticisms of CrossFit along the way I've been like yeah if you parse that out you, I agree so if someone's like hey you can get hurt if you don't learn to do Olympic lifts well and then you do them while you're very fatigued, you can get hurt. Yep, Absolutely. That's correct. Yeah, yep. <laughs> you know, if you learn to do them correctly and you, you know, a huge part of this is just like jujitsu. If, e if your ego is driving you, look, if your ego is driving you, okay, cool. Your ego should, should make you not want to tap out in jujitsu. Your ego should want to get two more reps. Your ego should want to, you know, beat the time. But ju just like in, in the SEAL teams, your ego should say, hey, I want our platoon to be the best. I want to win this shooting drill. But if your ego starts driving you to a point where you're making bad decisions, now it becomes a problem. Just like if your ego, you, you, know, you get your arm broken or your shoulder torn apart because you didn't tap in jujitsu, that's not beneficial. If your ego won't say, you know what? My form is falling apart right now and I need to scale this weight. You're gonna get hurt yep. if your ego is you know saying oh you know I'm, I'm competing against Dave on the pistol right now and I can see that his he could do this he could make this movement a little smoother on his on his holster but I'm not gonna tell him so now I'm hurting my team so I can win like those are terrible things so I, I think as I see and as I saw because I again I mean we've had a CrossFit affiliate here since 2007 as I saw those Criticisms, I'd say, yes, that's correct. Here's what we need to do to watch out for that. Oh, the whole idea, again, this is one of the things, just like Gracie Jiu Jitsu brought a lot of things to martial arts. The ideal of scalable workouts. I never heard of that. Yeah. Never, we, didn't, we didn't hear yeah. about that. Yeah. In the exactly. SEAL teams, I never heard about scale. Look, hey, if, if you're gonna deadlift and you couldn't deadlift as much as me, sure, you're gonna deadlift less weight, but it wasn't a thing. Yeah. It wasn't a thing. So to say, oh yeah, if you think you're gonna go and you're gonna clean and jerk 135 30 times for time and, and that's 70% of your max clean and jerk, you're not being smart. Yeah. And you need to put your ego in check. Most new people should not do 30 clean and jerks at 135 for time, but could they do 30 clean and jerks with an empty PVC pipe, picking up a stick, bring yep. it to their shoulder and going overhead? probably and completely safely.
Yep. And so the, definitely the scaling aspect and what people forget about a lot in the criticism of the, the danger of CrossFit, our core charter we talk about in our course is mechanics, consistency, and then intensity. And with mechanics, it's about learning how to do the movement, learn how to do it correctly. And that journey probably isn't a 15 minute session <laughs> at your first session. That journey can be uh, a couple months. Mm -hmm. Mechanic, consistent, do it well, do it well over and over. And then after your mechanics, are consistently well, good, then you can add intensity and then you go for time. But that's been our charter from Greg wrote that, scripted that early on, and that's what we teach, often ignored and often ignored in the expression of it. What I mean by that is like sometimes trainers get people and it's easy just to like go mm -hmm. and like here, but we've got to really it's so effective because it's so complex. And what I mean by that, these movements, these complex movements, there's a lot of bang for your buck and there's a lot of respect that needs to come with that. And they need to, you need to give them the intention that they deserve with training and education on how to do them prior to adding the intensity piece. Because uh, yeah, intensity and poor technique, intensity being going fast and high reps, for example, are a recipe for disa disaster. On the 30 clean and jerks at 135 the opposite end of the spectrum now there's guys that'll do 30 clean and jerks at 225 <laughs> you know so salute unheard of like just seeing the progression and the, the the whole full spectrum of it yeah um the uh and you know we the same thing there was a lot of criticism around like rhabdo yep and you you can get rhabdo um i don't know if i've ever had it. i don't actually think i've ever had it um, I have not either. I, I think you know. Again, the pri probably, in my opinion, one of the primary causes of rhabdo would be ego, yep. because if I'm trying to hang with you and I haven't worked out for the last four months or six months or maybe two years, and you're doing a, a you're doing a, a heavy fran, and I'm like, I can actually do it, you know, because I still have some muscle memory. And so now I push myself so hard, I'm not conditioned for it, and that's when we end up with issues. Again, ego, and look, as, as instructor cadre, you gotta watch out for that stuff, for all these things, you know? Yep, yep. The instructor cadre is responsible for saying, putting egos in check. Yes, You know, absolutely. for saying, hey, you know, we have to do this in jujitsu. I, I remember this is, with kids training kids, I would be very, I would always keep close monitor on kids, because kids don't wanna tap. Like their egos go crazy. And another kid's just like, oh, they're not tapping. Cool, I'm gonna keep going. And so I would stop for them. And it's like, you have to have that mentality with adults too. <laughs> how, when kids training kids, how old would the kids, are the kids that are training the kids? No, no, they're training against kids. Oh, tra I'm sorry, training training against I, yeah, yeah, I was like, yeah, I didn't realize, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah they're, just, they're just having matches. They're, yep. not, they're not instructors. Uh, so it, it seems like if you, if you wanna focus on the criticisms and if someone's hearing about CrossFit and they want to Google like what's bad about CrossFit, cool. You can find what's bad about CrossFit. And if you don't say what are the mitigating approaches that handle these issues, then you won't know about them. So I, I think it's a, the education of what's happening right now is getting people educated where they're like, oh, okay, I understand what's going on. I understand what the limitations are. I understand what what guardrails need to be put in place to mitigate these things from happening. We need, to, we need to do a much better job, CrossFit does, at this point of educating society on the safety and efficacy of the program in general. And we need to, all, all the um, safety protocols and all the, the path through even to this intensity should be common knowledge to anyone interested in this style of training that like, yeah, CrossFit, mechanics, consistency, intensity, CrossFit, they don't recommend that you go 100% when you first walk in there. They recommend you check your ego. For the benefit of our affiliate owners and our gym owners to get more people into the gyms, our job, CrossFit HQ, call it, we need to be telling the world all of these things on a regular basis. I, I truly believe that um, we're not, I would say, doing a great job of it right now. I hope to work with our team to get us to a better spot where we are letting the world, everyone know um, how safe it is and how, the, how good the trainers are. And we have to do a, a better job of making the trainers better. We have to help the affiliates become better because we have to um, 
let the world know that it's a great training option because it really is. And it's for anyone and everyone. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to pitch it, but I've just lived it for the last 20 years, but I am because it's, um, it's the most effective training protocol out there. And one of the things we've done is we've demystified training. And what I mean by that is this, uh, this notion of training being for these, uh, call it the NSCA coaches and, and these um, Olympic weightlifting coaches that are, that are on a pedestal. Like you, these movements are complex, but they're um, accessible to all of us. You can do them, I can do them, he can do them. Our kids can do them. They just need to be trained in them, and they just need to um, have proper instruction. The funny thing is I was telling this to um, one of the captains I met with recently um, on in Fort Stewart, actually in Fort Bragg. I, I said the, the deadlift, the squat, the clean and jerk, the snatch for soldiers should be just like how to break down your M4. And what I mean by that is the points of performance for all of those movements, they should learn through their training at every stage of training, how to identify good movement and how to perform good movement and how to correct good movement, just like they learn how to break down and service their M4. Now, that's a foundational knowledge they should have. And then you have experts you have strength and conditioning coaches, just like you have armorers, mm -hmm. that when you need a little more help or you want to n need more knowledge, you take your gun to the armorer. If you want to learn more about programming or learn more about movement, you go to the strength and conditioning coach. So there's a, there's a world where we need to educate the soldiers more on these movements, and that plays back out to just this general concept of the general public. These are things that everyone should be doing, and they're not hard to, uh, hard to learn or hard to do once you have good instruction and coaches. Mm -hmm. Now, CrossFit the last, I guess it's been two years, you've mentioned a couple times you got fired. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, like, uh, I, I guess an entire paradigm shift inside of CrossFit. Um, Greg Glassman, who founded it, he, he's like a, I, 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 I've met him before, I don't, I can't even say I really know him, I mean, I, but, you know, just knowing about him, he was kind of like this libertarian to the core kind of guy. Spoke his mind to a fault, I would say. And the reason I say that, because some people are like, oh, you can't do that. You should speak your mind. Well, if you speak your mind and it creates an outcome that you didn't really want, then maybe speaking your mind, you could have done a better job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, that kind of stuff got him into trouble. Yep, absolutely. Um, CrossFit at some point left social media completely. Yep. Uh, and and just he be, it seemed like he became increasingly like outspoken uh, about political issues and about things that, you know, honestly, I was looking through some of the stuff that he would say and I was like, mm, this is, you know, I like to talk about simple, clear, concise communication that people understand. It wasn't always, right? Yep. It was always stuff like, well, what does that actually mean? What are we trying to say here? It ended up not working out good for him. Yes. Um, Greg had a way of communicating that, um, where you talk about simple, clean, clear communication. Greg had a way, oh, wait, I said that wrong, didn't I? Simple, simple clear, concise, yeah. Simple, clear, concise. Greg had a way of um, not doing simple, clear, concise communication by design, kind of to let, uh, kind of make you think and go, what did he just say? And have to peel layers back because he was so intelligent and he, he's a fucking mad scientist genius. Um, he did that deliberately. And yes, kind of at the end of the day, that did catch up with him because he, um, in the, the tweet, he what he said was definitely misunderstood by what his intent was with it. And it got him in a lot of trouble. And a lot of his concepts were, um, he had to dive in a layer deeper to really understand what he's trying to say, but but he didn't have a, he didn't he didn't want to dumb his talk down. He wanted to elevate his speech and let people kind of come up and figure it out. And one one approach, I'm not going to say it was right or wrong, but that's the way he he liked to do it. He liked to communicate. So he communicates himself out of a job, kind of. <laughs> um, uh, you actually became CEO for what a month, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, like a month and a half. At that point, he hadn't, he had not sold the company, mm -hmm. and so he he did the tweet, got in a lot of um, trouble over that, 
and then um, ended up stepping back, still owned the company, put me in as CEO. And then there was some other stuff that started coming out and more attention was drawn to him. They, they piled on him and then he, um, there was a lot more pressure to sell. There's actually a phase where I think had this second round of attacks not come at him, had it just been the original tweet, that he would have had a better chance, um, call it, surviving as owner with me as CEO and then getting out on the other side. But the second barrage of, of um, call it, um, attacks really just got him to a place where like, okay, I'm going to sell this thing. And he, he put a number out there internally, or not even to the team, but amongst himself and his inner team. And someone met it. And so he ended up selling the company. And when he sold it, the, the team who bought it, the guy who led the effort to buy the team was like, hey, I'm putting myself in a CEO. I'm like, yeah, I get it, dude. He just bought the company. So like I had no, once I knew there was talk of selling going on, I had no like aspirations to fight for the position or to like, I'm gonna stay here regardless because I'm a realist. I knew what that represented. So that guy comes in, this, uh company buys the company company buys crossfit they put in this new ceo he didn't last that long either right i mean how long was he there for maybe a year and a half um if that he i I don't remember the exact timeline but um he ended up firing me and then shortly after that he um he left and then shortly after that i came back (laughs) (laughs) and uh, you know uh for me, a lot of this drama stuff, this is, for lack of a better word, drama. I know it's your life, yeah, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I hate to just like paint it as like, oh, it's just a bunch of drama. And it is a bunch of drama. Like, that's yeah. what it is. It's freaking drama. And I, the, the whole time I was kind of like looking at it, thinking it's a lot of drama, but still kind of, because again, I'm sitting here with a CrossFit gym that I've had for 15 years. It's like, wh- where is this going? Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm not a very, I don't, I don't overreact to things. I kind of let things play out and see what's going to happen. And, and finally you, you know, as this new CEO came on board, um, Don, how do you say his last name? Fall, fall, fall? Yep. Don fall comes on board. He actually went to the Naval Academy with Leif who wrote this book with me <laughs> and, and another book with me is, and you know, he was in the Marine Corps. He, he worked in a bunch of like, you know, tech companies as a legit, like business guy with military background, with leadership experience, and that kind of gets it to where it is now. Like like right now, it seems as though, honestly, for the 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 most I've seen, um, and I, I think you know when you talk about Glassman, I think his approach, like you talked about his pro- approach with like communications, he also had a weird approach with leadership. You know, like oh yeah, it was like hey, we're gonna like. Uh, almost again, I said libertarian, but that was also applied to, to the to leadership. Like, oh, if you're good, you'll do good, and your gym will do good, and if you're not, then your gym will fail, and that's the way. It'll, and it'll, hey, hey, you know, the brand will live on because the bad people will fail, and the good. Be- when maybe there's a better way to do those yeah. things, like you're talking about. Like, if someone's a shitty trainer. Yep. We shouldn't let him have a gym. If the gym is not have a certain standard, we shouldn't let it be there. But he didn't do that. Yeah. So now, it's, so so to me, I was always kind of, you know, again, I've got my own gym here. I'm doing my thing, which is kind of also in line with that attitude. Like, hey, we're right, we're here. we're not following your protocol. Like, I got my own gym. Like, we're yeah. we're gonna do it how we're gonna do it. So I was kind of okay with that. Not thinking about the fact that if you got someone that's a knucklehead running a gym, it can be problematic and the the brand a bad name. But that was his attitude. I would say now, I think. Uh, it is a high point for me, from my vision of CrossFit over the last however many years it's been, and 15 years for me, is that right, or has it been 25? It's been a long time that I've been around <laughs> it. Uh, <coughs> um, yeah, I guess it's 15 or 16 years. This is the time, it seems like the, the clearest vision, the best quality, the unified goals, it seems like things are as good as they have ever been for CrossFit right now. I, I believe things are really good for CrossFit right now. Um, it, Don 
Don Fall was a great hire by the board, a great decision in terms of just someone who their background, specifically, you know, the Navy time, or I'm sorry, the uh, Naval Academy, and then the Marine Corps time, and then what he did after that in the Silicon, <coughs> Silicon Valley, he checked a lot of boxes. And he, what I mean by that is like, here's someone that definitely um, can relate to a lot of the staff, a lot of the people like myself who have military backgrounds. A lot of our um, community is, you look at our roots and our history, it kind of is this counterculture, seal-like uh, movement in the beginning that grew to much more than that. But having someone with his experience in this role um, showed an awareness and appreciation for where we've been and who we are that is powerful. And since he's been here, yeah, he's, he's done a really great job in terms of um, bringing our team together, kind of um, galvanizing our mission and giving us clear vision. He, he is a much different leader <laughs> than Greg. I would say Greg wasn't even a leader at <laughs> times. He, he was a leader of a movement, but um, I mean, to be honest, we, he and I, we are good friends. We're still friends to this day. I talk to him on a regular basis. We had a complex relationship. We had a wild ride together just as, as friends and as um, business uh, or as boss and employee. Um, his style and my style or our style of leadership <laughs> was very different. And, um, and that um, caused problems at times. And even some of the crazy things he did in the past um, with like the social media and some of those things you talked about, y you know, like um, to say that the team was on board or to say that there were things that we were doing as a company or things that he was saying as a company that we were uh, supporting and on board with and bought in on, it, it would I would be lying if I said mm -hmm. that. I mean, he, and he was, he was the sole owner, and so people would always tell me that. He's the sole owner, so he can do whatever he wants. That was true, and he did. Yep. <laughs> and uh, and I, and the problem with that, too, is a lot of us, because it was such a public, it's not your local um, construction company. You know what I mean? It's a global brand that um, represented a lot of employees, represents a lot of uh, affiliates. And so the things he did at times w was definitely in – let's call it isolation of, of a lot of the team members being on board. Yeah, and w when you mentioned the, like the SEAL team's counterculture, the, the, the rebel nature, which is absolutely true. That's, that's part of who we are. But what I saw, and I'm sure you saw this too, the change and the professionalization of the SEAL teams as we grew mm -hmm. and as the war continued and as we got bigger and as we had more people and as we had more visibility we had to become more and more professional yep and it, it seems like that's that's what the transition is happening now and has been going on for the last you know six months to a year with CrossFit and and I'll tell you what it's been awesome for me um, you know, we, I, I was actually trying, because we have been talking with CrossFit and Jocko Fuel for like the last, I don't know, that's what I was trying to figure out. I don't know where it started. At some point, there well, was. Well, when I saw you at Bobby's um, memorial, right? you had mentioned that you guys were talking, and then I dug in with our team, and um, at that point, it was early in the um, early stages of development. Y yeah, and I, the, the connection was so natural, right? Like. Yep. Like here we have Jocko Fuel, we, we make supplements to make you perform better. We make protein, we make energy drinks, we make, like that's what we do. And I here I am, had a CrossFit gym since 2007. Like it, it CrossFit to me, as I mentioned, was something that was always trying to benefit the world and make people better. And I've gotten a bunch of people to do CrossFit over the years and to, to, to try and make them better. And Jocko Fuel is the same thing. Like we're here, we are trying to help people optimize their performance in whatever realm that they're in. And so you have this real obvious kind of unified 
attitude at both companies of like, hey, we got two companies that are trying to help people get better. And um, I thought that was cool. And again, I, I'm not exactly, I don't know who reached out to who first. I don't think it was, I mean, I don't, I don't know where it came from. And I remember my, if they would have asked me this two years ago, two years ago, I would have been like, hey man, I, like, I, I don't know. There's a lot of, yeah, yep. there's a lot of, polarization around it there's a lot of people that that hate on it and a lot of negative feelings about it and there's a lot of positive feelings too and we're gonna end up in this weird world uh but but since the timing was good and i'm looking at where everything's at and i see the progress being made for me it was like the perfect time for to, to kind of join forces pretty yeah. awesome yeah we're definitely uh the last few years we've been on our heels and maybe even before the last two years, what I mean by that is just um, working to pull ourselves up. Um, specifically, the last two years after the the Glassman, um, after the tweet incident. But even before that, we had shut down our social media. We had shut off a lot of our media creation. And when you think about at that time, um, as a longtime affiliate owner, you're an affiliate owner, other affiliate owners. What value or what is CrossFit doing for me if we're shutting off our mega mouthpiece, our mega areas to communicate with the world, the safety and efficacy of the program, and, and we're not doing that anymore, then what are you doing? You're just taking my money and putting or, or, or letting me use the name? And that, there became a point when that wasn't enough. And so, yeah, the, the whole shutdowns of the social media was not on not a fan of and i did not think that did any favors it, and it and then obviously the transition and that phase we were just clawing our way back and now you are right it is it feels like we're in a much better place and an area to uh to grow on and expand from when i was fired and we talked about this briefly i uh i lived it out publicly and that was a weird, like, just like what I mean by that is like uh, everybody knew. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I worked for, again, that construction company example, a construction company. It's, I got fired and I had to, you know, I could go home and deal with it however I wanted. But like the whole CrossFit world knew. And that was interesting. It was, um, I definitely wish I could get fired and not have the whole world have to know again <laughs> if that ever happens again, but I think those days are gone. Um, so being in this position in this with this call it spotlight, it's um, it's a burden. I mean, not a burden, but it's like a, it's a weight. It's like, you know, I, I don't mean a burden in how I am or how I act because how I act or how I am is consistent and the same regardless of if I was popular in the community <laughs> or not popular. How I work and how I conduct business is the same, but there's this extra weight of like um, the eyeballs, the, the, the attacks. And I didn't cover this earlier, but in terms of the attacks, like, Way early on, I just stopped looking. And I, I drew a couple of rules for myself with social media early, early on. One, I was never going to comment. So even to this day on any of my platforms, I don't respond to anything. I just feel like it's a slippery slope. And two, um, early, early on, there was a bunch of um, haters and um, that had blogs or whatnot, and they'd come after us. And one of them, I forgot which one it was, he posted something. And my wife at the time, or she's still my wife, but at the time she was training at CrossFit Coronado and he had pulled a picture from the website, from their website of her training and posted it and went after her form, but didn't cite her name or didn't say it was, but he was coming after CrossFit and us with an image of her and I was fucking pissed off. And I didn't know if it, he must have known and he was doing that to get at me. But at that point, I was like, I will never put my family out there. And that's another thing I've had, like this wall of like, I don't post pictures of them or with them. I don't, um, because I don't want to have to deal with anyone saying anything and how it's going to make me react to that. So the best way I can handle it is just, nope, they're not out there. And I keep the private part of my life completely private. And so what I do put out there or what I do show is super deliberate is super thought through it's uh it's not by accident i've actually i have a second um 
I have another Instagram account. I don't even use my main one that much anymore where because I'm into shooting, as I mentioned. I just post hunting and shooting stuff. And it's like, hey, if you're into that stuff, you can go watch me do that and see that there. And I don't even have to put it on my main account because um, that stuff obviously is is polarizing. So and let me rephrase that. I don't put it out in a polarizing way. Like I'm not like posting stuff and talking about the Second Amendment or talking about any of these issues going on. I just um, post videos of me doing my passion. What you like to do. And what I like to do. Yeah, I, it's funny because like I I only, I, I from my perspective, like, oh, I, I saw you got fired, but like that was it. There's no, yeah. It was no drama for me. Yeah, yeah, right? of course. <laughs> I'm watching you get fired. But the, the thing that was kind of weird for me is like, I, I've i known you, I guess, now we've confirmed since 2007. Yep. Um, you didn't, I was just a random team guy. I wasn't yep. like some like author or social media person. I was just a normal dude. Yep. And since day one, you were just like, cool. Yep. Uh, like, I remember you'd say, oh, you want to come to this thing? Yep. I'd email you once every three years. It's funny you say that. That's what someone asked me, like, how do you know Jocko? I, I'd say, I'd responded with, every few years he emails me asking for a spot to yep. a seminar I, I, <laughs> for one of his it, trainers. Yeah, once every three years I'd email him and be like, hey, bro, yep. hope everything's cool. Yep. Uh, I see there's a, a level one cert in San Diego. I need to get recertified. You'd be like, yep, you're in. Yep. That was it. Yep. No, no reason. And this was when either I was still in the teams and was just, you know, like you had no reason to do this other than you were just a good dude that was just trying to help a brother out, right? Yep. And so that's my been my interaction with you. And then I'd go and, you know, I'd see you there and you'd be like, hey, what's going on? We'd talk about yep. whatever and then carry on. Yep. It wasn't like, well, he hasn't called me in a while. Like yeah. you had every, you actually, I'm the, because I'm a, I'm, I don't communicate with people. Yeah. Like I don't respond to people. Like I don't, I don't have a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, I don't, you're not going to hear from me on your birthday, like that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. And so I would reach out to you like, hey, I need to go to this thing or hey, can we send a guy to that? And you'd be like, yep, cool, all, all done. Yep. Again, for no reason other than just like we met, you seem cool, I guess I seem cool. We're f considered each other to be cool, we're good. Yep. And that's, so when I would see people like getting, <laughs> I saw people like getting crazy about you, I was like, bro, what is, what is going on? And you know, I, I, I think that just, um, I guess that's a little bit of the nature of the beast when you're, in a position like you're in, people are gonna find things to attack and and look for reasons to try and bring you down and bring down what you're doing. Um, I guess well, that's part of the joy. <laughs> the fitness the fitness is polarizing in its nature. Oh, that's true. Right? Fitness and nutrition, right? Well, yeah. this fitness and nutrition, but this specific CrossFit, this style of fitness is even polarizing within fitness. And then you find someone in it, Greg or myself, at the top, and people who are leading it, and then they become easy targets. Because you just don't want to attack the brand, you want to attack the people. Mm -hmm. You know what's funny about all the people that attack us too? It's like, um, I don't like, well, I don't like bodybuilding for one, but you will never find me on any bodybuilding sites mm -hmm. or any bodybuilding forums talking shit about bodybuilders. Otherwise, Echo would be calling you out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no problem. You know what I mean? So like, or yoga, I'm not a yoga fan. Although I will say big picture, I appreciate both of those activities for people being in them and being fit and trying to change their lives. But my point is it's a unique person or a special person who doesn't like something and then goes over to their pages and goes over to their forums and starts blasting it. Yep. It's it's a horrible person actually is what it is. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not a good way to go through life. You know, as your, as your fourth grade teacher told you and your dad told you and your mom told you and your principal told you, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it, man. Yep, yep. And that, Proves to be true. Um, we got this little collab going, I guess. Chocolate Fuel and CrossFit. That's what we got going on. Uh, hey, if you have a gym, a CrossFit gym, and you want to carry Jocko Fuel, you can email jfsales at jockofuel.com. Uh, we're doing some, if you want to try Jocko Fuel, we're doing a, like a, there's terms in the in the retail world of selling buy one get one at 50% off jockofuel.com and free shipping over 99 bucks. We're trying to introduce people to what we've got going on. Um we got a bunch of product for you guys to try, but that's because I want you to get better. 
I want you to go to the gym. I want you to eat clean. That's what I want you to do. I think Dave wants you to do the same thing. <laughs> you got a lot going on. <laughs> we got a lot going you on. You also man. do clothing, right? Yeah, we have uh, we have a clothing company. Shoes, one hundred percent made in America. We got we make boots right now. Um, we make you know jeans, jujitsu geese, rash guards, shorts, hoodies. Uh, I'm working on something, not to the level you have, but I'm working on something. Right on, awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I look forward to whatever you're working on. Does this does this get us? I'll up tell to you. Sp- Olive oil. <laughs> Olive oil? Yeah. Olive oil. Oh, sweet. Right yeah. on. Uh, I've been saying that for years. And uh, you got guys in CrossFit selling coffee. You got guys selling, um, eat, there's even some people that sell alcohol, wine, beer, whatever. Um, I'm like, no one in our space is selling something as clean and pure as olive oil i'm in let's talk after we get done yeah um, for I'm, sure i'm in 100 percent where <laughs> um, I'm, i want in on that that's what i do uh does that get does that get us up speed where we're at right now yeah absolutely um, uh, we're excited we're excited to be working with a brand like yours it's uh, been years i think in the making and as you said it's the right time <laughs> it's an awesome time um echo yes sir do you have any questions i do bodybuilding questions no we'll, we'll skip that one so when you're in the Navy, you can have another job? Or is that like an exception? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Usually, no. Well, I know no, we know another guy that did that. And I was all confused. I was uh-huh. like, wait, how are you still in the Navy? If uh-huh. you're, you literally have like this company and this job or whatever. Like, so what's the, what's the deal then? It depends at what occasion. And sometimes you have to be really formal and get like written permission all the way up to your CO. And, and oftentimes, if, if I was not at that role I had, there was no way it could have been done. Like if I was at a regular SEAL team yeah. where I was deploying and training, I could not have done yeah. the role. Unique time, unique circumstance, mm. unique leadership that allowed me to. So. so so it's essentially what you can get away with with varying degrees of officiality kind of a scenario? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, it, and it's almost, it's always going to be on a not to interfere basis. Right. In right. other words, no matter what happens, this Navy job is the absolute priority. Oh, so yeah, you yeah. got to be careful that makes one. sense. Yeah. Cool man. Great to meet you in person. Yeah, I nice to know. meet you too. Right on. Uh, CrossFit dot com is where you can find out about CrossFit. You can find it on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at CrossFit. Dave. You're on Instagram. Yep. You're on Twitter. Now, the one I know is the Dave Castro. Yep, that's is, my Instagram. That's the one? That's the big one. And then I have the hunting one, which is uh, at TDC Hunts. At TDC, the Dave Castro Hunts. Yep. Uh, and you got CrossFitRanch.com. Yeah. Yep, we have CrossFitRanch.com too, where people can sign up for drop-ins to go work out at the ranch, which is a pretty cool. People who travel do that a lot. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. It's a pretty cool site. Yep. I have one more question. Yeah. If I go to the CrossFit Ranch, can I do a bodybuilding routine? Uh, you, you can. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> you can. Yeah, Special you can. Man. See? See? Special See? permission. You go. I got this guy. You can ask this guy. He does Met Cons now. Yep. Nice. He, that's true. all from me. He used to just be just uh, nothing but curls. <laughs> but, <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> I did his I did his bicep. He's got a bicep routine. I did it today. I nice. did it today. Hell first yeah. time. Yeah. You know, we're gonna work on those buys a little bit. <laughs> uh, awesome man. Dave, any closing thoughts? No, thank you for having me on. This was a pleasure. Well, um honored and I'm enjoying your book. <laughs> thanks, man. And uh thanks for coming down. Thanks for sharing your experiences, thanks for sharing your lessons learned and um most important, thanks for your service to the teams, to the country. I know you don't talk about it, but um, I know it's serious service and sacrifice. So thank you for that. And thanks for what you continue to do today to go out there and try and help people become faster and stronger and fitter, which helps them with every aspect of their life that is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, Dave Castro has left the building echo yes you did not get to go as deep mm. into bodybuilding mm-hmm. as, especially he kind of came at it too a little bit he literally said he didn't like bodybuilding no he said he respects it as uh, no he said he, he didn't like it at first sure and then I think I don't think he said he said he respected yoga I think <laughs> no bro I think he, he respects yoga but doesn't respect bodybuilding he said I'm not down for bodybuilding but I don't go uh, hate on them in their forms or okay something like cool this. cool have you ever been to a bodybuilding forum on the interwebs no I have not. disappointing I don't think I figured I, you'd be all up in there <laughs> I don't spend much time in forums to say the honest truth to you check yeah
They, they, they seem like they might be a place for negativity. Maybe. I don't know. Well, that's what it seems like. Yeah. Ma- free, uh, free for all. Well, I know that fitness as a space, if you will, fitness. I don't care. Yeah. CrossFit, bodybuilding, uh, f- fun- functional fitness. Functional fitness. Yo, powerlifting, power Olympic lifting, lifting. The whole gig um, <clears throat> is a very uh, like competitive, real like. It's controversial. Controver- like yeah, like if there's gonna be some controversy that comes out, they're gonna they're gonna talk about it. They're gonna hate on it. They're gonna be passionate. Gonna, there's gonna yeah. be a lot of passion in the top. Yeah, there's a lot of different approaches to fitness, and there's a lot of different approaches to different goals within fitness mm-hmm. as well. So like how you kind of started to talk about diet. Okay, fitness, diet, how to raise kids, poli- political stuff, and religion. Five. That's the mm-hmm. big five. We call them the big five. Is that, is that your big five, or is that a a more known big five. It's a known big five, not called the big five. Big mm-hmm. five is something else. But it's called five topics to avoid at Thanksgiving dinner. The what are they again? Re- religion. Religion. Diet. Okay, hold on. Slow down. Religion. Okay. Pa- yep. Diet. There can be some controversy around that. Diet. Okay. Yep. There's definitely controversy around that. Exercise. For a little while in my life, my wife told me don't talk about diet with her friends. Correct. <laughs> she was correct. Yep. This is in the old school days. Yep. I was ahead of the curve. Yep, yep. She would be like, "Just don't. Can you not talk about this, please?" Yep. And I'd be like, "All right, cool." Yeah. Plus, but they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do they know? Yep. Okay. So we got re- diet, religion, politics, politics, certainly, fitness, fitness. Yes, sir. How to raise kids. Interesting. Yeah, yep. I'm gonna say that's probably all. That's of true, them. Bro. So yeah, if there's gonna be some drama in any uh, industry, and you select. One of those industries, you can. There's a high likelihood that mm-hmm. the drama is going to be sky high. Yeah, and look, there's drama. This is what you know we we talked about, and I I didn't mean to diminish the drama that that Dave you know actually lived through, mm. but from my perspective, it is it it was a bunch of drama. Like you yeah. know, I'm watching it like, geez, what are these people They're going crazy, attacking each other, and all this stuff. So yeah. the good thing is, and as I said. If they would have come, if we would have started talking two years ago, mm. like Jocko Fuel and CrossFit, mm-hmm. uh, I would have not been too fired up for it. Yeah. And who knows what they would have been, I don't know. But I'm just saying from my perspective two years ago, yeah. three years ago, it's like there's a lot of mayhem going on. Yeah. But it, they, they certainly have moved and are, I think they're in a much more positive place right now. Um, and I think it's gonna be awesome because CrossFit is, uh, gateway to fitness for so many people so many people and I think that's gonna be awesome I think that people hearing about it more is gonna get more people to go and try it I think the fact that they've gotten better as coaches and as instructors is gonna be beneficial to everybody and yeah I'm looking forward to see where this goes we got I mean the stuff that we're making right now too at Jocko Fuel is like gonna be so beneficial we got i'm a drink i'm actually drinking some hydration right now have you tried the hydrate yet hydrate jocko no, hydrate i got my first one today you tried it today no i didn't i didn't oh you it. haven't even mixed it up yeah, yet. yeah you know. that's coming june 9th june 9th i think is when is when the hydration's coming out it's, it's awesome we got time war we got joint warfare we got the the protein cookies we got peach we got so many good so much good stuff that we're coming out with right now you know what i think is going to be and i was talking to jason kalipa do you know who that is yeah i was talking to him the other day and he said because he's got a couple like crossfit gyms and he advises a bunch of people and he's a former crossfit champ and he's like yeah the ready to drink protein yeah and the go Mm -hmm. (laughs) to to it's the same it's it's such a good combo Mm -hmm. to go oh i'm going to do the activity go right i'm done with the activity Mm -hmm. i need to recover milk get the full get the protein full protocol i mean this is what this is my protocol now by the way and having like here at Mm -hmm. victory mma when you can just get done and you're walking to your car and you're drinking a milk yeah you feel the goodness when i crack a go like I walk to my eyes, I'm walking. I have a, is this bougie to have a beverage refrigerator in your house? Yes. Okay. I, I am admitting bougie. to a level of bourgeoisie. Yep. I have a beverage refrigerator in my house that yes. is filled mm-hmm. with beverages. Those beverages are 
go and mulk. <laughs> Just beverages. <laughs> Just beverages. Yeah, yeah, that's bougie. It is. That's okay. good, though. But that's what I have. Yeah. But when I'm going to <clears throat> come to the gym, yeah. I'm walking, I go past my beverage refrigerator, my bourgeoisie beverage refrigerator, and I get <laughs> a go, and I yeah. open it, and I drive here, and it's like, it's the perfect time, yeah. and then I get here, get changed. By the time I'm stepping on the mat, I feel it. <laughs> I have the exact same protocol. Well, essentially, where, yeah, I actually can't really go anywhere that's that takes more than 15 minutes without bringing a go, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Like, there, there are very few exceptions. Mm-hmm. We went someplace, me and the fam, go. Mm-hmm. Come down to train today, go. go. Yeah, all day. You know what's another, I don't know, you call it a sleeper. I don't even think it's a sleeper. The greens? Mm. The greens are good. This is the thing that yeah. the, well, greens aren't known to be good. That's greens are thing. known to be bad. Greens is the kind of like, hey, look, I don't want to eat a you whole bunch of rough, roughage, you know, in real <laughs> life. So I'm going to take a, a cool, like, legitimate supplement. But you got to understand, it's just like, it's just a bunch of greens kind of mashed up. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's it. But they're not known for taste. That's the thing. <laughs> so it's like, okay, if you're going to rough it, at least rough it just for a little while. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, we're going to go through it. Cool. We've all accepted that. That was kind of the, the original <laughs> protocol. The you know, they'll be like, hey, what should we tell people about the greens? Mm-hmm. This is me imitating everyone. At sure, everyone talking else's to me. voice. Yep, you know? yep. It's a combination of Joe Moss, of Pete, of Brian, <laughs> sure. of all them. They, when I combine all their voices together, they sound like us. Hey, what do you think we should <laughs> So they'll say like, hey, what do you think we should, what's a good thing to say about, what should we tell people about green? And I go, mm-hmm. hey, tell people your greens don't have to taste like dirt. Yeah, that's How's perfect. that? Perfect. Your greens don't have to taste like dirt. Mm-hmm. Tell them that. Because greens taste like dirt. Yeah. No reason for that. Yeah. There's no reason for that. Dirt and moss. Like there's Dirt a bit of moss. moss. Yeah. For sure. And you know, when you're a little kid, yeah. let's face it, you were looking at a piece of moss, it looked like it might taste good. <laughs> well, right? That's how sure. we know what dirt and moss tastes like. Yeah. yeah exactly. And then That's for some true. reason people thought just because you ate it when you were five, yeah. you're still gonna gut through it. No. No reason for it. No nope. greens, peach greens. Anyways, that's what's going on. We uh, have a little partnership that we formed up with CrossFit. So if you're going to start doing CrossFit, you're going to need to fuel yourself. Get yourself some Jocko Fuel. JockoFuel.com. Go check that out. Like I said, we gotta, we're got we doing a little special to welcome the CrossFitters out there into the fold. Buy one, get one, 50% off. And free shipping over 99 bucks. That's a big deal because shipping can cost a lot. Mm. But if you buy more than 99 bucks, then you're good to go. So there you go. Go check that out. JockoFuel.com. Also check out OriginUSA.com. Because OriginUSA.com, we have stuff that's made in America. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people right now in the world that are pro-human rights. And let me ask you this. Have you met anyone that's pro-slavery? No. Well, no. Okay. I have not. I have not met another human in my lifetime that was pro slavery. Yeah. And yet there's slavery right now. Yeah. There's slavery right now. It's true. And I can tell you where it is. It's if you look at the tag on your clothing and it says made in China, they might as well say made by chained people because that's what's going on over there. Yep. Uh, don't do that. Nope. Don't support slavery. Support, don't support. Um, environmental disaster, which is all, when you have a factory in America, there's inspectors that come to see what's happening, to see what kind of waste is coming out of your factory. And I'm talking about the factories that I have. Mm -hmm. There's inspectors that come and you're not allowed to put certain things, chemicals into the ground or chemicals into the air. You're not allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. There's rules and regulations. There's no rules and regulations overseas. They're just dumping their chemicals into the water, into the air, they don't care. So for all those reasons, go to Origin USA and get yourself a pair of jeans. By the way, best jeans you'll ever get. I was gonna say, just, and just <laughs> in case, a small chance comes around, uh, comes around in your head that you care about how, uh, how you look in some jeans, I throw in that reason as well. Or if you care how you function. Yes, sir. Because you might be into the fashion Sure. Over on this side of the table, sure. we're in a function. Okay, there you so go. So there okay. you go. Uh, go to originusa.com. Get true. yourself some stuff. Some also, stuff. also Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. Go to jockostore.com. When you really, look, we're on the path. Look, whether you do CrossFit, Jiu-Jitsu, both, running, lifting, bodybuilding, whatever. Actually, I'm going to be honest. 
I don't know that I do bodybuilding. I I actually know that. I, I, I well, do no, no, do no, wait, 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 wait. Let's say this. Your your CrossFit uh, modality sure includes bodybuilding, <laughs> right? Am I wrong? Well, let me think. Okay, so does shoulder press, dumbbells? <laughs> okay, I already answered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I did uh, four sets of fifteen with a body minute building. and body ten rest between bodybuilding to failure or almost to failure, body that's bodybuilding, huh? Yeah, yeah, shoulder yeah. press. I mean, I'll ask you. That's bodybuilding, right? Yeah. What is the purpose? As you like to say, why are you doing that? To make my shoulders strong. So when to I make your shoulders your what? To make your, of your shoulders me, what? Strong. Is there any <laughs> concern about size? <laughs> Look, am I going into the five sets of twelve kind of scenario? Wait, what did I do? Fifteen. I yeah, you said fifteen. No. Hey, look. If they happen to get bigger, hey man, cool. Yes, I will consider That's that a win. Bonus. It's, it's a win, yes, sir. <laughs> but I do do deep squats. Yep. I do do a uh, clean and press. Yep. Good. Good. As part of a Metcon. Yep. This is my yep, routine, go. by the I way. So, hey, man, yep. I'm doing like the I whole said, gig. You're good doing the whole gig. Bodybuilding. Yeah. Hey, I will say this. I do bodybuilding type exercises like tricep pull downs. You do them curls? Curls. All day. I do those things. Good. Why? Look, do I do also do cleans? Yes. Yeah. Do I also do presses? Yes. Yeah. But I found that keeping your like smaller muscle groups also engaged mm -hmm. is useful. Yeah. And let's face it, we want to have guns. <laughs> <laughs> See, no one's going to be go, mad at you. No one's going to be mad at you. Let's go. Uh, but yes, okay, good. Okay, good. I do some bodybuilding movement. I don't do, because you consider the whole routine. In the spirit of all these modalities, as it were, consider the whole routine. If it's a hybrid of bodybuilding, strength training, nah, Olympic lifting, clean and press, clean and jerk as part of a Metcon. So that's some Olympic lifting. There's mm -hmm. some CrossFit in there because it's some stuff is for time. Sometimes it's a AMRAP. What's the as many? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's that. So there's some CrossFit in there kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, what else would there be? Yeah, the bodybuilding stuff for sure. So, okay, as a comprehensive program, what is that? It's like kind of everything, right? Yeah. Which kind of yeah. makes it CrossFit. And then I do the jiu honest with you. Yeah. And the jiu -jitsu. Wow. There you go. But um, <laughs> either way, hey, look, it's part of the protocol. It's part of the routine. Same thing with the whole, you know, nutrition, diet, exercise. Mm -hmm. It's part of the whole routine. It's part of the path. Ah, you see what I'm saying? Go. I see exactly so what you're saying. Back to Jocko's store. If you want to represent <laughs> while you're on this path, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You go to JockoStore.com. Yeah, Discipline jo equals freedom. It's true. It's an oxymoron or a hypo, what do you call it when it contradicts you it? Call it the truth. Yeah, but it is true. We also have the shirt locker, which is a subscription shirt scenario. You get a new shirt every every uh, every month, mm. different designs. Some good uh, good feedback on that one. Uh, subscribe to that. Subscribe to this podcast. Subscribe to JockoUnderground.com. We appreciate your support. We don't own this platform. Unless you're listening on Jocko Underground, we don't own the platform. That means they could be getting in there and editing it out or removing it, banning us. They might be banning us because we... Are doing bicep curls? No, <laughs> it's possible. Uh, Jocko, that's JockoUnderground.com. Go check that out. YouTube subscription, uh, Jocko Podcast Official, Origin USA. Go check out the video Pete just put up. We were able to give a raise to everybody up there at in Maine. So go go watch that video. You'll you'll see what I'm talking about. That's at that's at Origin. Uh, Origin USA YouTube, also Jocko Fuel YouTube channel. If you want to know what's going on inside Jocko Fuel, or with, not, that's more like not inside, that's like with Jocko Fuel. This is yeah. what we're making right now. Okay. So check that one out. Uh, Psychological Warfare, Flipside Canvas. I just talked to Dakota today. Mm. Dakota Meyer. You know what he's doing? Well, he's getting after it, man. I understand. And if you want to get after it like Dakota, go to flipsidecanvas.com. Check that out. I got a bunch of books that I've written. You can check out those books that I've written. Also have a leadership consultancy called Echelon Front. Go to echelonfront.com if you need leadership inside your organization. We will help you out. We do live events, and they all sell out. We oversold our last muster. We had mm. to like... The staff had to sit in the back corner and all this stuff. Really? So we sell everything out. So if you want to go to one of our live events, go to echelonfront.com and check out our live events. Also, if like I said, if you have problems in your organization, those problems, oh, you how do you know what the problems are causing the problems? Jocko, you don't even know what industry we are. I know what's causing the problems. It's leadership problems. So if you want to solve the problems in your team, in your organization, go to echelonfront.com. 
and we will come and work with you. We also have a we have an online trading academy for life to interact with other human beings. You know, if you want to interact with other human beings, you you need to learn it. It's not a natural thing. I was talking to Ty. You know SD Ty? I do. Yeah. Sandy. He used to be, yeah. he used to, he's transitioned. He was yeah. main Ty, but now he's become SD Ty. I hear good things. So SD Ty, I was talking to him, and he, you know, he was talking about having conversations with people and how he's starting to become aware of, oh, these are the things that I've heard you talking about, and now I can see them. Yeah. And I can detach enough to make sure that I am taking the right approach. Yeah. That is what you learn on extremeownership.com. How to interact with other people, how to converse with them, how to ask earnest questions, how to see their point of view, how to influence them, how to allow yourself to be influenced. All these things are in there. A little bit of magic. It's kind of like jujitsu. I was going to say, Bray, you made such, uh, the other day, you made a good point where you're like, hey, if you know how to, if you're doing all this stuff or whatever, imagine how, and I, it, it made, made me kind of go down this little, whatever, psychological mm-hmm. rabbit hole where, and you're right, it's the same as jujitsu, same as fitness, mm-hmm. lifting weights. It's the same as like reading, even something as fundamental as reading. Mm-hmm. Imagine if you were the only one who knew how to read right now, just all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Or let's say you were only one of like eight people in the whole wide world or whatever. They knew how to read. You know how, how easy things would be for you compared if, to everybody else? If you're the only person that knew how to do jujitsu. Jiu-jitsu. If you're the only person that knew how to do an overhead squat, you would yeah. go challenging people to, to squ- overhead, overhead squat <laughs> contest. Well, let's say if you were the only person who lifted weights and ran and, and did good nutrition. Mm-hmm. First, everyone else just ate the normal stuff, didn't lift at all. You know how, how much stronger it would be? It'd be easy. Life would be easy for you in just, a way. Just walking around ruling the planet. It's it's kind of the same. Thing. It is, it the, is same. the same thing. Yeah, it's a little it's the same thing. It's actually what's different is if if I know jujitsu, powerful skill to have. Powerful skill to have. If I know it, mm. when do I get to use it? Right, you're right. I get to use it if you want to use it with me right. and you come to my gym or if yeah. we happen to be in the streets right. and you happen to assault me. Maybe I get to use some jujitsu. Yeah. If it's strength training, maybe a car is on top of a baby and I get to lift it up, right? Maybe. We're not going to set that up on purpose. Mm-hmm. But this extremeownership.com, this is daily interaction with other human beings. Yeah. This is figuring out what you need to do to maneuver correctly through life so that you can build relationships where your life is moving forward and getting better rather than moving backward and getting worse. Mm-hmm. That's simple. That's a real simple question. Yep. When has it been good that you had an antagonistic relationship with someone? Never. Like, like oh, you, oh, I don't like my boss. Okay, mm-hmm. does it help you that, that you're fighting? Oh, I don't like this peer of mine. Does it help you that you don't like each other? I don't like this subordinate of mine. Does it help you that you don't like each other? Yeah. I don't like my neighbor. Well, how does that work out? I don't like the garbage man. Okay, well, how does that work out? If you if you have a good relationship with your garbage man, guess what? He, some of the garbage spills out. He runs out of the truck and throws it in. He takes care of you. Bro, that's so true because, I'm bro. I'm telling you. Bro, you ever see, I'm <laughs> telling seen you, those bro. guys who like, come on, let's face that garbage truck sometimes can be rough. Yeah, oh, and yeah. your garbage like, like yeah. overflows and flies inside. Bro, he's not getting out of his truck. No. Bro, he has many no. more garbage things no. to take care of. No, but when you it's line true. up your cans correctly, yeah. And when you're out there, like maybe maybe once every other week, you're out there and you're helping. You just give him a little help, man. You can hear the garbage truck coming. Let's face it. Get out there. It's true. You do that every once in a while. You build that little relationship. All of a sudden, he's taking. He's being a little bit more gentle with your kids. Then you gotta take him down to the city when they break. It's a, <laughs> it's a problem. Your whole life could be better. It's true. So that's the kind of thing when you start thinking about it, you start making every aspect of your life better because you got a good relationship with your garbage man. Got a good relationship with your wife, with your kids, with your peers, with your boss, with your subordinates, with the other team over there, the other department, the other division. They're like, oh, hey, Jocko, what's going on? How much? What's going on with you? Oh, so, huh. yep. that's not a big deal. It's true. It's just going to make everyone's life better. Yep. So go to extremeownership.com. Learn a little bit of the magic. <laughs> and if you want to help service members active and retired, you want to help their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. If you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to America's Mighty Warriors.org. And also don't forget about Micah Fink, who is currently at this time, apparently, last report, he was 
out in a field of rocks and he was slinging rocks at waterfowl and then swimming in the frigid waters to go recover them and eat them raw. He's helping veterans relocate their soul. Heroesandhorses.org. And if you want to connect with us, Echo is at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. You can find CrossFit at CrossFit.com. They're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. They re-engaged in those things. They are at CrossFit. And Dave Castro, he's Twitter at the Dave Castro. And also Instagram at the Dave Castro. And he's got that CrossFit ranch. And thanks once again to Dave for coming down, sharing your lessons. More important, of course, thank you for your service in the teams and for our great nation. And thanks to everyone who has served or is serving in the military. Thank you for protecting our freedom. And also, thank you to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, and all first responders. Thank you for protecting us and keeping us safe here at home. And everyone else out here, let me ask you something. What are you doing right now? Right now, what are you doing? Are you getting better or are you getting worse? Are you getting stronger or are you getting weaker? Are you building or are you decaying? Are you becoming less capable or are you becoming more capable? What are you doing? I'm asking you that question, but you need to ask yourself that question. What are you doing daily? What are you doing hourly? What are you doing this very second? Ask yourself that question. What am I doing? Because there's a decent chance you aren't doing anything productive. You're wasting time and you're wasting your life and you're wasting away. Do not let that happen. Get control, take over, and go. Now. And that's all we've got for tonight. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko.